Uh, you can share your video, Joey. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, we are seeing the video. You can share also your camera. Okay. Hi, so I, I'm going to start. I don't know if you guys can see me. If no, it's, uh, it's fine. Yes, yes, Joey, we can see you. Okay. Uh, the only bus, just for technicality, is the only host. I will change the host between different parties. The one who is speaking, I will put him or her as a host. So the host will be able only to share his video or her video. And everyone can share the slides. We have almost 101 attendee within the meeting. So those 101 attendee, they will not be able to share or to speak. Okay, so Joey, it's uh, for you. Okay, I can see myself, so I hope everyone can see me. <laughs> so um, we are very happy to have you with us in this very first edition of the Clean Tech Learning Series. We hope you are all doing great and safe and most importantly, surviving at home, taking this time for a better future, hopefully. Um, some people might have asked why we are running the Clean Tech Learning Series. Well, now is the time to think on how to improve our lives in the near future, as this is not anymore a choice, but unfortunately, it is now an obligation towards our planet. We will eventually need two Earth to sustain the way we are living today by 2030. There has never been a more urgent need for clean, sustainable solutions in waste, water, energy, transportation, and agriculture than today. Our country has suffered enough from high deterioration in the infrastructure and hygiene sectors and high cost of uh, uh, operating and consuming energy and water, among many other things. Today, we are aiming to create a community of entrepreneurs, experts, partners, NGO, public and private sectors, anybody that can help and support in the creation of the startups that would be able to answer not only the local challenges, but also regional and international needs in this specific uh, sector. The Clean Tech Learning Sessions are organized by Beritech under the Clean Energy Program and it's funded by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Lebanon. Um, I will go quickly through the program. So I'm going to share my screen. So Beritech will offer the startups, the resources, knowledge, uh, support and funding necessary to scale and grow. Uh, I will talk uh, quickly. Uh, just one second. Okay. Okay, so I will talk quickly about uh, the accelerator program. 
So the accelerator is open for innovations in the clean tech sector, whether it's in waste, water uh, management and water, uh, renewable energy, transportation, and uh, agriculture. So what we will be doing for the first batch, we will start probably mid of July. So the call for applications are open until June 7. So if anybody thinks that they have uh, an innovative idea in the clean tech sector, please go to veritech.org. There is a section called um, program. So you go on clean energy and then you can see whether you, you are eligible to apply or no. So uh, about the accelerator as such, uh, it's divided into three phases. The first one is the validation phase where we take uh, uh, up to 24 companies and we work with them over uh, two months uh, and we support them in $2,000 in grant among workshop and many other things for them to validate their market and their solutions. In the second phase, which is the acceleration phase, from these 24 companies, we will take up to 12 teams and we will work with them uh, for four months for them to develop their MVP and start getting uh, traction. And we here we will give them up to 15,000 in support grant. Finally, the last phase is the incubation and growth. Uh, it's a five month uh, phase where they will get 20,000 ma in matching grants and we will select up to eight companies to be able uh, to continue and to scale hopefully. So, uh, as I said, we will be supporting the solutions tackling the challenges in the clean tech sector. So here we're talking about agriculture, transportation, energy, water and waste. Uh, uh, and uh, we will run the clean energy accelerator over two batches. As I said, the deadline to apply is on June 7. So please, I urge you to check the website if you think that you are eligible to join and uh, submit your application and help so that we can help you um, make the world a better place. So to go back to the clean tech learning series, the goal of the clean tech learning sessions mainly is to provide enough material for the entrepreneurs to answer the existing challenges in the clean tech sector with innovative solutions and create a community around the sector to support the entrepreneurs, especially that investment in the sector are rising and the challenges could only mean business opportunities for innovative entrepreneurs. So the Clean Tech Learning Series will happen every Tuesday in April on Zoom. Um, so since now we don't have any other option. And we will have every week a different guest speaker and entrepreneur that will be discussing challenges and solutions uh, in the clean tech sector, specifically in this case, in waste management, water and wastewater management, and last but not least, renewable energy. So at the end of the session, we will open door for a Q&A session for both the guest speaker and the entrepreneur. This will happen on Slido. I will share with you now the, the code that you will have to use to be able to answer to, uh, your questions. Okay. So this is it. Salah, do you want to say anything about this? Yes. So first, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you the, for attending the meeting. Uh, thank you, dear uh, panelists and speakers. Uh, so all your questions need to be answered or while doing the session, while doing the meetup and the webinar, all your questions need to be addressed online. So the speaker can open this uh, link and check your questions while doing the presentation. After the presentation, the, the speakers will be answering all the stacked questions and we will be managing that on Slido. Please open from your mobile, slido.com, put the code and you can directly start posting your questions. Thank you, Salah. So obviously, Salah is a techie guy and not me because I'm getting a bit confused <laughs> with, with all of this. So, this is, uh, we revised our best quotation. Okay, so uh, after, yeah, it, Salah, can you please mute? Yes, no. Thanks. <laughs> so today in this first hour, we will welcome Ziad Abishakir as our guest speaker and successful entrepreneur in waste management. 
He will be talking about the role of the private sector yes, as well as the role of yes, the entrepreneur yes. after the virus uh, pandemic to avoid another health crisis. Ziad is a multidisciplinary engineer and an activist in fighting waste. He started Cedar Environmental and an environmental and industrial engineering uh, organizations that aim to build recycling plants. He also developed a new technology transforming plastic bags into solid plastic panels to echo board. Ziad, thank you so much for answering our invitation and we are glad to have you with us in this Clean Tech Learning Series. I will leave you now to lead the, on the presentation. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so are we doing this without the video or with the video? Uh, can you please try to open the video and share your slides? It's not. It's not open. Uh, what about the slides? But slides. <sighs> can you see it? Yes, definitely. What can you see? I'm a look. Can you see like the seven categories of waste? Yes. Okay. It's an it's an image. Yes. Okay. Right. Hala shum naamil. So you you can start and we are uh, checking the how to fix the video thing. Okay. Right. خليني شوف أنا الكنترول سبولي وين وين. So. Okay. Uh, yes, you can please open the video now. Where's the ad? We are not hearing you. Hello. Hey, hello, we're hearing you. Okay, I'm back. Uh, sorry, yes. I uh, I had a problem with my. Uh, yes. Okay. Now we, we see you. And you can see me. Brilliant. Definitely. طيب عال. حد عنده مين نحكي بالعربي؟ فضل الله. Okay. عال. تمام. طيب. تنحكي اليوم شوية هيك يعني إذا حد بنبلش نبلش نحكي بال. بمشكلة النفايات بلبنان ما بنعود ما بنعود نخلص رح ركز بس على شو نحن عم نجرب نعمل حتى نشرك القطاع الخاص اول شيء ولحتى نغير الخطه يلي محطوطه او يلي عم تتبع بموضوع ملف النفايات المنزليه بالخصوص والنفايات ال العامة إذا بدكن عن يلي نحن منطلعها كمجتمع بحب إنه أول ما نبلش الحديث أحطكن يعني عندي كان هل سلايد يلي بلشنا فيها ال... أوكي حدا نريس دير هاندز كيف فينا نعرف شو Hello. What will happen if you want Ziad, you can go through the uh, uh, Admo, and then we will go on Slido and answer all the questions. Okay. Uh, type can uh, I don't know why I sh I lost it as well here. Okay. So there he is. Okay. Fine. Okay. خلينا نبلش. We 
we lost you, Ziad. Okay, so in the meantime, I think Ziad Ma'id Ma'ana Mahek. Yes, there is this connection from Ziad's side. Ah, he's back. I, I, uh, I switched to 4G because I think the connection is the best thing that I can call it is a crazy سو so, uh, كنا عم نحكي بالسبع فئات النفايات uh, وقلنا انه uh, بالمبدا حيلا خطه بدنا نحطها لاداره النفايات بدها تاخذ بعين الاعتبار هول السبعه كاتيجوريز هالسبعه كاتيجوريز هن النفايات المنزليه اللي هي نحن هلا بمشكل لها وهلا من بعد ما نخلص من كورونا بعتقد رح ببين مشكل النفايات الصلبه لانه المطامر يلي انعملت صارت تقريبا مليانه عندنا كاتيجوري اسمها سلوتر هاوس ويست اللي هي نفايات المسالخ يلي هي نوع كمان من النفايات يلي لازم نتعامل معه بطريقه كثير جديه على فكره الريحه يلي بنشمها بالمطار لما بنكون جايين اكثريتها هي جايه من سلوتر هاوس ويست مكبوب حد المطار منطقه الشويفات فيها 14 مسلخ لحم ودجاج وكلهم بكبوا البقايا تبعهم بال بالمجرير يلي بتنزلهم بيمرقوا بمحطه هنيك اسمها محطه الغدير وبينزلوا على البحر وبيتجمعوا هنيك هيدول الروايح يلي بنشمها لما بنكون قاعدين قاطعين حد المطار ثالث كاتيجوري هي شيء اسمه اندستري ويست او النفايات الصناعيه يلي انا برايي هيدي منجم بعد ما عم نعرف نستفيد منه مزبوط يلي منكم فاميلير بكونسبت اسمه سيركولر ايكونومي يلي هلا كلهم كل بلاد العالم عم تحكي بشيء اسمه سيركولر ايكونومي السيركولر ايكونومي اكثر شيء مبلشه هي بنفايات المصانع، يعني مبدا السيركلر ايكونومي انهم ياخذوا الباي برودكت يلي هو مفروض يكون ويست للمعمل نمبر 1 ويكون هو يصير الرو ماتيريال للمعمل نمبر 2 والباي برودكت تبع معمل نمبر 2 هن الرو ماتيريال لمعمل نمبر 3 وهكذا دواليك ات كيبس روتيتنج سو ما حدا بكب شيء او ما حدا بيضطر يحرق شيء. الرابع كاتيجوري هي ميديكال وفارماسيوتيكال ويست يمكن هلا بلبنان في بس اركانسيال عم بيعملوا تريتمنت مبدئي للميديكال ويست بيعملوا له اوتوكلافينج بس بعدين بنرجع بنكبه بالمطمر اللي عم نجرب نشتغل عليه هو انه نوصل ما بقى نستعمل مطامر او ما بقى نستعمل محارم خامس كاتيجوري اللي هي يمكن اهم سيكتور هلا بنصح يلا حدا بده يفوت فيه هو موضوع المجارير نحن كبلد فينا نعتبر انه فشل نحن كبلد بعتبر انه فشلنا فشل كثير كبير بموضوع معالجه المجارير تبعنا كل ضيعنا ما عنده سيستم مجرير او يلي عندهم سيستم مجرير منه ماشي او في محطه بس ما في شبكه تنقل المي المجرير على الشبكه على المحطه او في شبكه بس ما في محطه يعني ما بعرف كيف دائما كانت تنعمل هالمشاريع دائما يكون فيها نقص. سادس كاتيجوري شيء اسمه الكترونيك ويست اللي هي النفايات الالكترونيه اللي بلشت تكتر وبلشت تصير مأذيه هيدا سيكتور كثير واعد هلا ما في الا ايكو سيرف بلبنان عم بيجمعوا الكترونيك ويست وبيصدرون لشركه انجليزيه بتشتغل بجبل علي بالامارات. 
بعتوا كونتينر اوريدي بعتوا اول كونتينر الكترونيك ويست من لبنان مش ثلاث شهور او اربع شهور وهلا عم يشتغلوا على كونتينر يحضروا كونتينر ثاني اخر كاتيجوري كمان يلي ما عندنا شيء تقريبا بلبنان right, so uh, um, uh, 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 اوكي بنكمل يس بليز بنكمل لل 107 الباقيين طيب في قلنا اخر كاتيجوري هي الكونستراكشن اند اند ديبري ويست اللي هي نفايات العماره نفايات العماره يا اما نحن وعم نعمر بننتج نفايات او نحن وعم نرجع نجدد شي بيلدينج قديم من مننتج كثير حجار ومننتج حديد ومننتج تيبات بلاستيك وهيدي كلها مواد بالمبدا نظيفه لازم نقدر نقدر نرجع نشتغل فيها حبيت حط هال هالسبع اقسام من النفايات للكل يعرفوا فيها لانه بالخطه اللي نحن عاملينها واللي ما بعرف يمكن في منكم بيعرفوا انه انا كثير اللي زمان بحكي بشيء اسمه صفر نفايات مجتمع ما بينتج نفايات مجتمع بيقدر يعيد تصنيع كل شيء بالمبدا بده يكبه وعملنا شويه حسابات انه اذا هالسبع كاتيجوريز اخذناهم واستثمرنا فيهم وقدرنا نشغلهم بنقدر نخلق خمسين ألف وظيفة مباشرة وبنقدر نخلق ما لا يقل عن مليارين لثلاثة مليار دولار حركة اقتصادية سنوية يعني بالسنة إذا استثمرنا بهول السبعة كاتيجوريز يعني شو يعني استثمرنا بهول السبعة كاتيجوريز يعني حطينا بنية صناعية تحتية تنعالج نفية المسالخ حطينا بنية صناعية بكل البلد لحتى نعمل معالجة للمجرير تبعنا والمي يلي عالجناها ويلي صارت تنظيفة صالحة للري صار فينا نستعملها انه نقدر نسقي فيها مزروعات بدل ما نكون عم نستعمل مي مرة ونكبها هل الكومباوندينج اوف كل هال الاندستريال اكتيفيتي غير انها بتخلق 50 الف وظيفه قادره تو جنريت نيو ايكونوميك اكتيفيتي بتتراوح بين مليارين و3 مليار دولار بالسنه بايكونومي مثل ايكونومي لبنان قبل ما تخرب الدنيا 2 3 مليار بالسنه كانوا كثير حلوين بعتقد هلا صاروا ملكات جمال يعني بالوضع يلي نحن فيه هلا بالبلد دوك يلي منكم عم بفكر انه يستثمر او يفوت بموضوع ويست مانجمنت صار عندكم هول السبعه كاتيجوريز تقريبا تقريبا كلهم ذير ستيل اتس ا فيرجن ماركت يعني انا رح احكي شوي هلا على الهاوس هولد ويست لانه هيدي كاتيجوري اللي تقريبا 30 سنه بشتغل فيها الخطه يلي عم نشتغلها بالهاوس هولد ويست كمان هو انه اول شيء نكسر الاحتكار يلي موجود بملف هيدا النفايات لانه اذا انكسر هيدا الاحتكار لبنان ككل بده 40 40 شركه للمعالجه وبالخطه اللي حاطينها نحن بدنا تقريبا شي 60 شركه للنقل يلي هيدي كمان رح تخلق وظائف وتخلق حركه اقتصاديه بس اهم شيء رح تعمل شغل مظبوط بموضوع النفايات بدل ما بعدنا بعقلية جمع زبالة مشي فيها بالكاميونات وروح كبة بشي مطمر بشي محل ويلي هيدا بياخدني على السلايد الثاني يلي بدي فرجيكم يا يلي هو الموديل يلي هلأ نحن كبلد عم نستعمله
فولا أه ما بعرف كيف فيني اعرف اذا الكل شايفين السلايد ولا لا بس يس يا شايفين اوكي جريت طيب على اليمين على على شمالي انا ما بعرف انت وين بيكون على هيدا في تحت مكتوب ويست ايكوال بروبلم بارادايم اوكي يلي هي التايتل تبعه اتس سنترلايزد municipal recycling facility او يلي هو الموديل المركزي لخطه معالجه النفالي هذا موديل لنا 30 سنه بنستعمله من 92 وفي كثير بلدان كمان بتستعمله للاسف هالموديل بكل بساطه هو بت بتبشر فيه ناس بتعتبر انه النفايات هي مشكل بالنسبه لها النفايات هي مشكله وبما انه مشكله انا بدي اتخلص من المشكله وبما انه بدي اتخلص من المشكله خليني بعدها قد ما في عن الناس مشان هيك بيخلقوا بيلاقوا منطقه بيخلقوا فيها مطمر وبياخذوا هالنفايات عليها بينفوا النفايات عليها كلمة نفايات هي الروت لينغويستيك تبعولا هو من فعل نفى، اوكي؟ انه بعدهم، شيلهم عنه. هذا الموديل بلشناه بأول مرة ببرج حمود، يعني بعد ما خلصت الحرب بال 92 وقت خلق الجبل يلي هلا رجعوا نزلوه بالماي. استعملوا هذا الموديل لشي خمس سنين، بعدين راحوا على الناعمة. على مطمر الناعمه يلي تقريبا بلش بال 97 وضل ل جولاي 2015 لما صارت الازمه يعني قعدوا تقريبا شيء 17 سنه او 18 سنه بس نكب بمطمر الناعمه بدون ما يكون عندنا الترناتيف بلان ثاني انه اذا شي نهار سكر المطمر شو بدنا نعمل بالزباله ومشان هيك صار عندنا شفنا كلنا انه الزباله ضلت على الطرقات لانه ما كان في الترناتيف بلان انه وين بدها تروح هالزباله بحال هيدا المطمر صار اي عمل طارئ ومنع انه الزباله تروح لهون بالموديل كمان المركزي في دائما بضل في مش كل الناس بيطلع لها انه تكبي هيدا المطمر، يعني في ناس بيبقوا بعاد شوي عن المطمر انه ما بتحرز تنقل لهم نفاياتهم مع انه كنا عم ندفع كلفه كثير باهظه بالنقل بالموديل من قبل لانه تصوروا انه كانوا يطلعوا على فريا مثلا يجيبوا زباله واخر شيء يروحوا يكبوها بالناعمه، يعني كانت عم تعمل برمه عروس من فج وغميق تطلع من فريا وتوصل على مطمر الناعمه. دونك هيدا هيدا الموديل برهن برهن انه من بعد اكيد وقت طويل لانه دائما كانوا يقدروا يطولوا حياته للمطمر. انه اليوم وصلنا لمحل ما عادوا لقوا مطمر ثاني انخلق مطمرين على البحر لانه ما حدا بقى في موضوع الثقه اليوم ما بقى في ولا حدا بلبنان عنده ثقه بملف النفايات بحدا ماسك ملف النفايات وعم بيجي يقول للناس تعوا لازم نعمل هيك او لازم نعمل هيك هيدا شيء هيدا خلق ابستكل كثير كبير واليوم لازم نقدر نتخطى بشغل يكون مزبوط وحدا يتحمل مسؤولية نجاحه أو فشله ما نضلنا مثل ما كان من قبل دايما بضيع الشنكاش ما بيعود حدا عارف حق على مين أو, أو ليش البارادايم يلي نحن عم عم نشتغل عليه لنا سنين كثيره وهيدي أنا تعلمته بالجامعة يعني من 30 سنة تقريبا هو مجموعة من الناس بتنظر للنفايات على انها ريسورس هيدي مواد هيدي مواد اولية هيدي مواد متواجدة بكترة وهيدي مواد انا ما فيني ما الي حق فلسفيا روح ابحش بالارض وطمه لانه 
اخلاقيا هيدا الشيء اول شيء ما بيصير اليوم نحن اتليست جيلنا وردنا وردنا انفايرمنت احسن بكثير من من اللي رح نورته للجنريشنز اللي جايين ورانا اذا ضلينا مكملين هيك يعني يعني اليوم اذا بدي اخذ بس على لبنان نحن وردنا قبل حرب ال 75 كان الانفايرمنت تبع لبنان تقريبا بعده غير مدقور تقريبا بعده غير مدقور يمكن اكبر اكبر انفايرمنتال كرايم انعمل بحق لبنان تاريخيا هو لما الفينيقيه بلشوا يقصوا شجر الارز ويعمروا فيهم بواخر او يبيعون خشب للمصاروه وللاشوريين ولا ما بعرف مين وبدون ما يكونوا عم يقدروا يزرعوا غيرهم او يعرفوا يزرعوا غيرهم بقى بس بقيت ما بقى كان بعد الانفايرمنت تبعنا ما كان كثير مأثر ما كنا نبحش ونطم زباله بالارض مشكلة الزبالة ما بينت إلا من بعد الستينات يعني لما بلشوا يخترعوا البلاستيك والباكجينج اللي شوية كومبلكس مثل ما بيقولوا كلنا بنتذكر جدودنا ما كانوا تقريبا يطلعوا نفايات أبدا بقى نحن اليوم على جونكشن كتير مهمة بوين من روح بالانفايرمنت تبع بلدنا بدءا بملف النفايات يا اما بدنا نستعمل هذا الموديل يلي هو لا مركزي والخطه يلي عم نشتغل عليها بتقول لبنان مقسم الى 26 دائره اداريه يلي هو القضاء كل قضاء هو مسؤول عن نفاياته ممنوع ناخذ زباله ناس ونروح نكبها عند ناس ثاني من برات هذا القضاء بكل قضاء في يا اما اتحاد بلديات واحد او ماكسيموم اتحادين بيقدروا يلاقوا اراضي وخلي كل قضاء يكون عنده المعمل المعالجه النفايات تبعه او مركز المعالجه مركز للفرز مركز للتخمير مركز لتجميع كل هالنفايات والشغل عليها يعني اليوم ما بقى بدنا انه مش الخطه مش يعني نخلق 26 مطمر الخطه هي انه نخلق أكثر من 70 معمل ونجرب بأول مرحلة ما نتخطى العشر مطامر للأشياء يلي عن جد ما عندنا صناعة لنقدر نرجع نصنعها ومع أنه أنا شخصيا ضد أنه ينعمل أي مطمر أنا بفضل نعمل شيء اسمه باركينج لوتس يعني للمواد يلي ما قادرين هلا ما عندنا المعامل حتى نعمل لها ريسايكلينج هيدي مواد هي انيرت ما بتتفاعل مثل البلاستيك وبتضاين كثير فاذا فينا نوضبها ونعمل لها باكجينج بطريقه ونحطها على جنب لحتى كنا عملنا البنيه الصناعيه التحتيه وقدرنا نرجع نعالجهم على فكره التكنولوجي تبع الريسايكلينج من بعد ما الصين سكرت على امريكا انها تبعت البلاستيك ويست تبعولها على الصين بلشت تمشي هلا بدورات كثير سريعه والتكنولوجيز عم تتطور بطريقه كثير سريعه كمان وانا في نقل لكم انه حتى بلبنان تقريبا نحن صار عندنا قدره انه نفبرك كل شيء في مكانات عايزينه مشان مشان ريسايكلينج اوف هاوس هولد ويست فاذا يلي عم نفكر فيه واللي عم نشتغل عليه هو ديسنترلايزد موديل 26 منطقه اداريه حديد نوصل لحديد 70 معمل النفايات بتنلم بدون ما تنضغط و ليش بدنا نلم النفايات بلا ما نضغطها؟ لانه بس نستعمل الكومباكتر تراك عم ننزع هيدي النفايات عم ننزعها كومبليتلي وما بيعود فينا نشتغل فيها لما بنشتغل بطريقه لا مركزيه بنخفف مسافات النقل ما بقى في مشوار من فريا على الناعمه فريا يمكن بتنزل نفاياتها لشي محل بوسط كسروين وين المعمل تبعهم بيكون موجود فاذا هيدي احدى او هيدي الخطه الرديفه يلي عم نجرب نشتغل عليها يلي اكيد ما كثير في سياسيين بحبوها لانه اليوم عم بت 
you you are diluting the central effect. لما بيكون في مركزية بيبقى في كنترول كتير حسيس على الموضوع والمشروع ومين بده يقبض ومين بيفوت على هالمشروع ومين ما بيفوت بينما لما عم نحكي ب 70 معمل ما حدا بيقدر يعمل مونوبول على 70 معمل طيب شو الخطه شو بتقول جروسو مودو نفايتنا نفايات لبنان على فكره أكتريتا أكتريتا هي نفايات عضوية في عندي سلايد هون رح فرجيكم إياها بما أنه يعني نحن نعمل كل شيء نطبخ كل شيء فروم سكراتش سو so كل مرة بدنا ننتج نفايات النفايات تبعنا بتكون كتير غنية بالمواد العضوية وهالمواد العضوية يلي أحسن شيء تنعمل شيء اسمه كومبوست سوري عم جرب جيب ال ما بعرف ليش ما فتحت بس إنه مو شيء سوري مش عم فوتوني شوفوني بقدر افتحها من هون فولا اوكي تريبيا سو هيدي التيبيكال كومبوزيشن لكيس زباله طالع من لبنان 70 ل 80% بالوزن يعني اذا هيدا الكيس وزنه 100 كيلو 70 ل 80% من وزنه هو بقايا اكل هل قد في نفايات قابله للتسبيخ يعني نعملها نعملها كومبوست مؤخرا نحن عندنا معمل ريسايكلينج سورتينج وكومبوستينج بمنطقه بيت ميري عملنا شيء اسمه ويست ستريم اناليسيس ل منطقه بيت ميري بشهر شباط وادار ولقينا انه المعدل الاورجانيك ويست هو 78% يلي هي بتوقع بين هال 70 وال 80% بقت ما بقى عندنا هول الاربعه خمسه كاتيجوريز ما بين ازاز ما بين الومنيوم بلاستيك في عندنا كثير صار في بلاستيك بال بمجرى النفايات اللي بنطلعه نحن كلبنانيه الميتلز عم بخفوا كثير الورق والكرتون كمان عم بيزيد ما دونك عندنا فائض من الورق والكرتون وعندنا معامل نقدر نعالجها بهال لهول المواد عندنا تقريبا شي 70 او 80 معمل بيشتغلوا بلاستيك اف وي سورت هالبلاستيك وبنودي لهم اياهم هول معامل بيعملوا بويات زهور بيعملوا قفاص للخضره بيعملوا نرابيش للري عندنا أربع معامل بيعملوا ريسايكلينج للورق والكرتون الإزاز كان عندنا معملين واحد انضرب بالحرب وواحد سكر هلا في معمل كان عم ينشغل عليه بالبقاع وكانوا حاطين بروفيجن إنه بآخر 2020 ببلشوا يشتغلوا ما عاد تعرفت هلا شو الوضع بظل الأزمة المالية أول شيء اللي صارت وهلا أكيد بموضوع كورونا هن موقفين الشغل هل هل اناليسيس هيدي كمان كثير مهمه تقلنا شو هن التكنيكس اللي بدنا نستعملهم لنعالج هالنفايات مشان هيك لما قالوا بدنا نحرق الزباله بلبنان دغري قلنا لهم انه زباله لبنان ما بتولع زباله لبنان 70 ل 80% من من مكوناتها هي مواد عضويه والمواد العضوية هي تقريبا 70 ل 80% ماي والماي ما بتولع، يعني ما فيكم تولعوها هيدي المواد مشان هيك خيار المحرقة هو خيار خاطئ. واضطريت روح اخذ كرو ورحنا على الدنمارك على على مدينة اسمها اودنس وقعدنا هنيك 10 ايام 
بالمحرقه تبعهم ما خلينا ستر مغطى يعني ما ما قبيناه وشفنا كيف تشتغل المحرقه وليش وكيف بيديروها وكذا هيدا الدوكيومنتري محطوط على اليوتيوب شانل تبعي اسمه ان انسنريتر فور بيروت اوكي وموجود كمان اتس بيند بوست على الفيسبوك بيج تبعي زياد ابي شاكر ابي شاكر فرد كلمه دغري بيطلع لكم اياه هو اول اول دوكيومنتري سو من هال من هالمنطلق نحن قررنا انه نستعمل تقنيه التخمير لا يعني او نعمل كومبوست من النفايات تبعنا لانه نحن بلد على فكره بيستورد نحن بنستورد كومبوست بكل بكل بساطه لما كان في ازمه النفايات بال2000 بلش بال2015 رحنا عملنا هيك دراسه صغيره انه نحن كبلد قد ايه قد ايه بنستورد كومبوست فتنا على الديتا بيس تبع الجمرك اللبناني الجمرك اللبناني عنده ديتا بيس كل شيء نحن بنستورد باي باي كاتيجوري وكل شيء نحن بنورد يعني everything we export and everything we import فتنا على الباند تبع organic fertilizers ولقينا انه نحن بخمس سنين يعني من 2011 ل 2015 لاخر 2015 نحن استوردنا 64715 طن organic fertilizer معمولين من organic waste او من animal manure أو من خليط من اثنين وبالمبدأ أكثرية البضاعة اللي بنستوردة هي خليط من الاثنين هال هال 64 ألف طن كلفوا تقريبا شيء 18 مليون دولار لأنه كانت كلفة الطن واصلة هي 271 هيدي كلفته واصلة على البور لعنا يعني بعد بدهم يسحبوه من البور وبدهم يخزنوه وبدهم يحطوا الكوست تبعهم كشركة وبدهم يوزعوه ويحطوا الربح تبعهم يعني نحن على الكوست دفعنا تقريبا 17 مليون ونص تستوردنا 64 ألف طن من ريسايكلد جاربج لبلدين نحن كنا نستورد اهم بلدين بيبعثوا لنا كومبوست مكيس هن هولندا اول شيء وايطاليا بثاني مرتبه وبهال خمس سنين راحوا 17 مليون ونص من دولاراتنا حتى نحن نشتري الريمانيفاكتشر ديزبيلي تبعولون او اورجانيك ويست تبعولون لحتى نقدر نحن نحطهم بالزراعه وتبين انه الحجم السوق يلي عندنا اياه هو اكثر بكثير من 64 الف طن بس نحن بس كنا عم نجيب 64 الف طن لانه الكلفه كلفه شحنه لهيدا هي كثير غاليه بقى وصل انا بعرف بالسوق يعني في بضاعه مش تحت 350 دولار او 400 دولار كان ينباع الطن ما بعتقد في ولا مزارع اليوم بيقدر يتحمل هاي الكلفه لانه كثير غاليه وبده يستعمل اطنان بينما نحن عندنا اياها هالريسورس هيدي موجوده ونحن كنا عم نكبها بال بالمطبر ريال نعم وي هاف ماني كويستشنز على سلايدو اف يو وونت وي كان تيك 10 مينتس تو انسر ذيم يلا كيف okay. فيني اشوفوا هذا سلايد انا يلا اي ويل شير ماي سكرين انا هيك يلا ون سكند اوكي كان يو سي ات يس ان يو اي اي دي ميك مليونز فروم تريدنج ريسايكلبلز واي ذس از نوت بينج امبلمنتد لحظه شوي انا هيدا السكرين تبعي هون تركي او سوري Um, okay. Oh, let 
Donc, so as an, an UAE, they make a trading. Why is not being implemented here? Any idea what could profit for Lebanon if we follow the same path here? Okay. Hal, hal trading by recyclables, Eddie Risir, la anno fi binia sinaiye maujude. Eliom anene anene el mai, hene imkin aktar aktar commodity matlube hal la bikil bled el alam. بس ما حدا بيشتريها بعد أنينة ماي يعني بدو يخدون بدو يكونوا مكبوسين مربطين بدها تكون بيلة هيدا البيلة هيدا البيلة وزنة بتراوح بين السبعين للمية كيلو فإذا بدو ينشغل عليها هيدي الخطة اللي عم نجرب نشتغل عليها إنه يصير عنا هالبنية الصناعية لحتى كل المواد القابلة للتدوير اللي عنا إياها نحنا نقدر ان نحدا نقدر نعطيها فاليو لحتى نقدر نبيعها. Composting should only be used for source separated organic waste before being contaminated when mixed with the rest of the waste stream. مزبوط انما اذا نقلنا النفايات بكميين منا ما بتضغطا بعد بتضل مثل ما هي وهيدا قلنا تقريبا خمس سنين أربع سنين عم نعملها ببيت ميري نقدر we can separate it ولا رح فرجيكم التست الكمبوست وحتى صورة الكمبوست يلي عملناه قديش قديش الكمبوست طلع نظيف وقديش طلع اللاب أناليسيس تبعه منيحة the strategy لحظة بس لحظة هون back to what is your strategy to influence policy maker to enforce uh, environmental legislative? Why you are not? Shu uh, hiye GH. Terjai bit. Terjai fina. Sorry, ma adert. It's the second question. Why you are not greenhouse gas emissions as a waste to in gas form? Ma baf ma femta hai de. Kif kif to influence policy makers? You know. أحسن ما ما the best influence method بالنسبة لإلي هي is to showcase عم نفرج كيف you know إحنا بيت ميري مش أول recycling plant نعمله في عنا recycling plant بضيعة اسمها خربة سلم اللي بيستعمل تقريبا نفس الميثودولوجي ونفس التكنولوجي إله من 2002 عم بيشتغل يعني هلا بسبتمبر بيكون صار إله 18 سنة عم يشتغل in why compost validity still a shy startup since the numbers you just showed up are huge. بفضل مارك هو يجاوب على هال على هالسؤال. I think اللي عنا potential ككل حدا بده يشتغل بالكمبوست. There's a huge potential because the market is very big. So it will depend on your capacity to produce as much compost as possible. In Europe. Session as well, so Kamen, uh, he's going to share his experience. Okay, fine. So in Europe, compost produced from organic recovered from mixed waste is not called compost, but rather stabilized biomass. Uh, in Europe, bilimmo lisbele be compactor trucks. عندن standard la compost, عندن standard la el biomass. نحنا بنستعمل a European standard, and we showed in the food. A part uh, that comes and make our compost is a very makes a very clean compost. I will share the uh, lab analysis. You cannot take Beit Miri as a representative for the waste of Lebanon. Oh, uh, yes, I can. Uh, it's a very good representative. Lano Beit Miri is a mixture of um, uh, mixture of. Uh, it's not an agricultural community. It's not a purely rural community, and it's not a metropolitan. يعني منا بيروت ومنا ضيعة بالبقاع هي مكسشر بين الاثنين ولقينا انه النفايات تبعهم هي a very good representative sample وانا شاغل بكتير ضيع بالجنوب تقريبا كتير قريبة ال waste makeup تبعولهم على شو في ببيت ميري سوري في حدا بعده عم بيسألني طيب راح فيك ترجع تعللي لي هيدي بليز اوكي يو ار نوت ادينغ ذا جرين هاوس عم تروح هيدي وين هي بدك تقلي انتو كان انت يو هاف اكسس تو ذيس سو جاست ليت مي نو 
عم بيطلعوا okay. انذر ما بعرف اياها بالذات لحظه لحظه وي سورت اور ويست ان ذا هاوسز بات هاو كان وي ميك شور ذات ذا سورتينج از كونتينيوينج وذا ميونسيباليتي ار تيكينج ذا جاربيج باكس ان ذا سيم تراك اذا هيدا التراك منه كومباكتر موست بروبابلي السورتينج عم بي uh, عم بيصير مزبوط اذا اخذوا الريسايكلبلز واخذوا الاكل وحطوهم بكومب بتراك وكبسون العمليه رايحه ضيعان ما في اي ما في اي نوع منها uh, نحن بقول لكم نحن ببيت ميري بنلمهم بنفس التراك لانه وي كان نوت افورد نبعث التراك مرتين uh, كذا بس نحن ما بنكبس النفايات اند وي يوز كولر كودد باجز وعندنا سورتينج يونت سو so, بتيجي الزباله منا مكبوسه بتتفضى وبنرجع بنشتغل على فصله بتكون اهين فروم ا كوست برسبكتيف وات ار ذا ريشوز امبورتد فيرسز لوكالي برودوسد او تقريبا تقريبا الكلفه بتنزل للنص بموضوع الكومبوست از ذير اني اوفيشال اند كريديبل سورس ذات هولدز ذا كوانتيتيز اند تايبس اوف ويست جنريتد ان لبنان انفورتشنتلي اي دونت نو هاو كريديبل ذي ار في رقم دائما بشوفه انه نحن كبلد بننتج 7000 طن زباله بالنهار. هاو كريديبل از ذات؟ انا بعرف انه نحن ك كبلد ك كافراد على معدل جمعه بننتج نص كيلو بالنهار، كل واحد منا بيطلع نص كيلو زباله بالنهار. قديش في ناس عايشه على التريتوري هون إذا بدنا نحكي عم نطلع 7000 طن ما بعرف إذا نحن عن جد 14 مليون ولا لا I think it's a it's a bit uh, it's a bit odd اوكي هيدي كانت كثير عم تمشي بسرعة Many waste characterization study done for Lebanon reveal 50 to 55 organic waste uh, uh, ما بعرف من وين جابوها أنا كل اللي أنا عملتهم ال studies بال 14 معمل اللي نحن شاغلينهم كلهم طلعوا فوق ال 70%. هو اند هاو تو انكارج بيبل تو ستارت ويست سورتينج يو نو ذيرز بلانتي اوف ذيرز بلانتي اوف انفورميشن اون لاين يو نو يو كان تيك ات اند ستارت. Would the 70 factories spread in Gaza provide input to national recycling factory to re-channel material to new of course يعني هو هيدا في في بال في هذا the very famous baseball movie انه if you build it they will come if اذا عن جد حطينا اذا عن جد حطينا 70 معمل وبلشوا يفرزوا ويطلعوا مواد خلقنا حافز للقطاع الخاص انه يستثمر بريسايكلينج البلاستيك يستثمر بريسايكلينج الكرتون يعملوا مصانع لحتى يعملوا نيو برودكتس من هول المواد انا برايي رح بنشجع الزراعه بعد اكثر واكثر لانه صار عندنا لوكال جود كومبوست برودكشن هاف يو اسيست ذا فيزيبيليتي اند افيليبيليتي اوف لاندز ذات ار سوتبل فور لاند فيلينج Um, للصراحة أنا I'm looking for lands for the feasibility of recycling plants, sorting, composting, recycling. أنا I'm بعتقد بلبنان it's gonna become impossible to find land for landfilling. I want to ask about the situation of glass waste in Lebanon. Okay, we do have a problem with glass waste. ما بقى عنا مصانع. نحن عملنا شيء اسمه The Green Glass Recycling Initiative for Lebanon عم نبعت الإزاز اللي منشيله من بيت ميري لعند الجلاس بلاورز بالصرفان and you know عنا هال initiative عم نشتغلها نحن وياهم What about the economy of scale when you increase the number of sorting facilities للإناء إنه السبعين facility على كل البلد would be the best economy of scale حتى نقدر نشتغل مزبوط How much is the needed investment to implement these technologies to use the waste as a resource? What is the expected income? Well, يعني هذا هيك سؤال ما فيني جاوب عليه هيك بال بالمبدا فيني الشغل اللي عم نشتغل عليه هو unit تعمل 25 طن زبالة بالنهار incoming 25 tons per day costs about 1.5 million dollars and should uh, should recuperate uh, should break even at the fourth. At the year, I'm a three and a half year, I'm a fourth year, and then is a معمولة مصبوط والديزاين مرتب والإكوبمنت المحطوط مفروض الضين خمسة عشر سنة. So you would have eleven years of steady income. 
What about agricultural waste, uh, such as empty pesticide bottles? Uh, under which category does it fall? Whole their uh, industrial waste, chemical, yani chemical waste. Can fee program can on be still a lion in the Almo Museria, Kifi Rasilla, Taistafid, Minil remnants of pesticides to the max. And then Yerja uh, Hot Plastic Maal Plastic Recyclables. Uh, excited to learn more about the opportunities in waste, water, and energy. Okay, yes, it is an exciting field. But uh, uh, you know, recycling is a poor man's slash women economy. We are on a path where we are becoming a poor economy. I think recycling is one of the sectors to invest in. Um, okay, Holy, uh, you are not adding the greenhouse emission as a waste too to implement low carbon or zero carbon strategy. Had a debate Tawil Arid, but I did Hala Mahana what in food fee. Um, uh, but Fine Ulchale in no bell waste treatment composting as a technology. Then add men all techniques that emit greenhouse gases. وبالعكس بالكربون كريدتينج بيعتبروا انه كومبوستينج وين يو كومبوست يو ار دايفيرتينج فروم ذا لاند فيل اند يو جيت كربون كريدت فور ات هلا انا بالنسبه لي راي شخصي كل هالسكيم اوف كربون كريدتينج واز اول بولشيت يعني ما ما بظن اخذنا نتيجه از ا بلانت Okay, okay. Fina, uh... yeah, yes. So we can take the last two questions and uh, voila. Uh, can you give us a brief insight on how water is being affected by this? Yani uh solid waste, water hayala mahal ptamil landfill, um ptamil Uh, a good um, leachate management. Leachate who will liquid the libinzal minerals belly limatmura. Eventually, the leachate will find its way to the underground water. But I know the most important thing in water is the mshirir. I mean, today, may Allah محل بتروحوا بلبنان اليوم فوق 250 متر علو عن سطح البحر كل البيوت عم بي كانوا بيستعملوا سبتك تانك. بدقوا مي وبكبوا المجارير تبعهم بال uh, بالارض وهيدا ايفنشلي اتس جونا كاتش اب وذ اس اند اتس جونا اند اب بولوتينج كل الاندر جراوند ووتر تبعنا وي شود بي فيري كيرفول اباوت ذس دو يو سي ذات اي او تي ميك سنس ان اجريكلتشر دومين لايك كلاسيفيكيشن تايب اوف تريز بريدكتينج ذا نيكست دايز ذا نيدز اوف ا بلانت اند اذر فيتشرز سوري ما بعرف ما ما فهمت السؤال اف يو اذا عم تسمع فيك ترجع تساله بغير طريقه اي وود اي وود تراي تو انسر ات وات دو يو كونسيدر ذا جريتست تشالنج فيسينغ سوليد ويست مانجمنت سيكتور ان لبنان اكبر تشالنج عندنا اياه هلا هو انه نكسر الاحتكار تبع الطبقه السياسيه على هيدا الملف مثل ما في احتكار على الكهرباء مثل ما في احتكار على الاتصالات في احتكار على النفايات والنتيجه كثير كثير عاطله بالاتصالات النتيجه كثير كثير عاطله كان لازم نحن نكون ببلد عنده اتصالات ونتورك انترنت اهم بكثير من يلي عندنا اياه هلا ما بعرف قديش بعد معي وقت بس بعتقد صارت ساعة أربعة and yes. uh, I should uh, leave for uh, the next panelist. Thank you so much, Zia. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh -huh. it was our pleasure. Um, uh, for the people, the uh, hella they joined us. Okay, we will go through the presentation again. ولحن عرفكن عن ال عن ال guest speakers اللي جايين بتاني session. For the other one that already watched this first session, you can take. Uh, seven minutes break <laughs> in between. Okay, thank you again, Ziad Anjad. My pleasure. Okay, so in the second session, we would be tackling uh, wastewater and, uh, and water management. Okay, we will go through the entire presentation again. So the people that are, uh, were already there in the previous uh, uh, 
a session, you can take a seven minutes break. Okay. So again, <laughs> for the people uh, who I just want to share. Before we go, I just want to yes. share a link to uh, to a documentary we shot in 2016. It's called Zero Waste Lebanon. It's available on my YouTube channel. So I'll put it here so you who wants to see it can see it. Okay, thanks. Yalla, I will I will share a link kamena. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ziad. Ahlan. So as you were saying in the first session, now it's the time to think on how to improve our lives in the near future. Since now this is not anymore a choice, but unfortunately it's an obligation. So we need to uh, innovate in the clean tech sector to be able to save our planet. We will eventually need the two Earths to sustain the way we are living today by 2030. There has never been a more urgent need for clean, uh, sustainable solution in waste, water, energy, transportation, and agriculture than today. Our country has suffered enough from high deterioration in the infrastructure and hygiene sector and high cost of operating and consuming energy and water, among many other things. Today, we are aiming to create a community of entrepreneurs, experts, partners, NGOs, public and private sectors as well, to help and support in the creation of startups that will be able to answer not only local, but also regional and international needs in the sector. The Clean Tech Learning Sessions are organized by Veritech under the Clean Energy Program, uh, which is funded by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Lebanon. I will explain briefly about the program. You can go on veritech.org and uh, read about it in more details. So through this program, the Clean Energy Accelerator, Veritech will offer the startups the resources, knowledge, support, and funding necessary to scale and grow. You can check the eligibility criteria on veritech.org. Mainly, we will be supporting solutions, uh, tackling challenges in the clean tech sector, so here I'm talking about agriculture, transportation, energy, water, and waste management. The accelerator will be divided into three phases. Uh, phase one, the heal validation. It's a two-month phase. We will select up to 24 teams and support them with their innovative ideas in the clean tech sector by providing them $2,000 in grants to validate and ensure that the product is fit uh, for market. From these 24 teams, we will select up to 12 teams to join the second phase, the acceleration phase. They will get 15,000 in support grants to build their MVP and test it with early adopters. The last phase, which is the incubation and growth, we will select Menhol 12. We will select up to eight startups to help them scale and get up to 20,000 in matching grants. The Clean Energy Ag uh, Accelerator will run over two batches. The deadline to apply for the first batch of the Clean Energy Accelerator is June 7. So if you think you have an innovative solution in the clean tech sector, I urge you to go and check the website and submit your application so we can help you make the world a better place. The goal of the clean tech learning session mainly is to provide enough material for the entrepreneurs to answer the existing challenges in the clean tech sector with innovative solutions and create a community around the sector to support the entrepreneur, especially that investments in the sector are rising and the challenges could only mean business opportunities for innovative uh, ideas. The clean uh, tech learning series will happen every Tuesday in April on Zoom having every week different guest speakers and entrepreneurs discussing the challenges faced in the clean tech sector. In this case, specifically uh, waste management, water and waste water management, and renewable energy. At the end of the session, we will open door for a Q&A session for both the guest speaker and the entrepreneur. So in the first uh, session that started at three, we had uh, Ziad Abishak that talked about uh, Hello, Yes, okay. yes, Joe. No. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so now uh, during the session on uh, water and wastewater management, 
We will have two guests, uh, guest speakers, uh, Salah Saliba and Macron. So we will start first uh, with uh, our expert Salah Saliba, who will be talking about the business opportunities to attract the participation of the private sector in water sector performance improvement. Salah is the private sector engagement team lead on the USAID-funded Lebanon Water Project at DAI. He has an extensive knowledge and experience in performance improvement, capacity building over a wide range of sectors, such as natural resource management, water supply, and sanitation. He holds an engineering degree in agriculture and an MS in land and water resources management. Salah, thank you for entering our invitation. We are glad to have you with us in this, uh, this second session today. So I will leave you to lead on the presentation. You can take, uh, you can start sharing your screen so that we can follow you. Yes, hello, Joey. Hi. Thank you. I'm gonna start by sharing my presentation. Uh, let me try to share screen. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Should I start the video as well? Yes, Bada. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm glad to see all the familiar names. I've, I've seen the names and the attendees. I'm glad that we have a fair large number of uh, attendees and they're interested in the subject matter. Um, thank you, Ziyad. Uh, your presentation was uh, very interesting. Uh, you paved the way for, for my presentation on the aspects related to water and wastewater. Uh, in my presentation, I will actually go over uh, what, what was said earlier. Um, we're showcasing here uh, what has been done for the past uh, four years under the Lebanon Water Project. Uh, this is a $80 million project funded by USAID, and it is uh, mainly focused around uh, improving the performance of the regional water establishments in Lebanon. Uh, for those who doesn't know, uh, we have, uh, who don't know, I'm sorry, we have four, five regional water authorities, uh, four regional water authorities, and the first would be the Litani River Authority. Okay, so our main work is focused on the public institutions that are by law um, and autonomous entities that are supposed to provide water and wastewater services as per the law 221. And then the latest law, which is the uh, code de law that was enacted uh, late uh, 2017, also uh, improves, uh, brings in improvements in the um, legal framework of those establishments, yet you need to have the um, the decrees require uh, the, the implementation decrees for this this law, which will happen uh, hopefully uh, once we're out of this uh, situation. Okay, so um, as you all know, we have uh, uh, all sorts of challenges related to water and wastewater in Lebanon. Uh, I will go over the few that are uh, overarching. Uh, there's there's load, load, a lot of details in each and each specific topic where, where you have different challenges. Um, uh, first of all, you we all are facing uh, water supply shortages in Lebanon that has uh, become a year-round crisis. Uh, there is an unreliable management of water through rationing, water supply scheduling, low uh, service standards in terms of quality, hours of supply, quantity, and uh, of course, this equally applies to wastewater management. However, people, we only see this, the aspect of wastewater in our pollu uh, in the pollu uh, pollution that we see around. Uh, Ziad described it well, this, the smell around the, uh, the airport is, is basically all the sewage that is going through uh, the networks all the way to the facility uh, at the port. And then uh, the smell is basically an anaerobic digestion of the, uh, um, of the, wastewater, by, of the wastewater by the time it reaches the, the treatment plant, which is a primary treatment plant anyways. Um, of course, this aspect 
that we do not give much important importance but nowadays you can see after the the crisis of the covid 19 you can see we are all following numbers um numbers are essential data is essential information is essential and we've realized that uh, through our projects that data is not always reliable you don't know uh, uh, you, you don't know which which is the benchmark who's the reliable source of uh, of, of uh, data information and data is key to operate uh, services for customers so uh, establishments are always short on uh, quantity produced data related to customers uh, how much is being distributed how much is being sold and the associated costs with that uh, in the past, this, this used to be acceptable in, in, another, uh, in, a, in a sense because probably you were, we were uh, uh, smaller communities. Now, uh, now that Lebanon for the past decades has grown uh, substantially, uh, you, have, you have to know uh, where are your customers and uh, how much you're supplying water. Uh, it's, it's basically like you're running an industry where uh, you don't know how much uh, you're producing uh, X amount of items per day. You don't know how much is is being sold in the market and what are the revenues that you are making and you cannot accordingly plan if you want to grow your industry and then eventually uh, in my opinion you will you will go bankrupt the latest uh, topic is now uh, water and uh, and energy nexus and i will go extensively uh, i will explain uh, the, the the showcases that we went through uh, with uh, within within the uh, scope of our project so LWP is, uh, LWP's objective is to provide clean and reliable and sustainable drinking water uh, to serve uh, Lebanese citizens. Of course, we're also addressing uh, topics and the issues related with, uh, with wastewater. So it's made of three components. The first one is to provide technical assistance and infrastructure uh, capital investments uh, to showcase mainly demand management at the level of uh, water supply. Uh, by installing customer meters and being able to monitor and measure the performance of water supply and of course to uh, invest in showcase uh, wastewater treatment facilities that can be replicated. The, the other two components which are the component two, the civic engagement and the uh, PPP that we will be addressing in this presentation uh, are fairly new. The, uh, USAID has realized through uh, the 10 year experience with the water establishment that uh, civic engagement is key. The, the citizens needs, they need to know, uh, and they, we need to know what the citizens' perception out of those services, and we need to uh, uh, address their concerns and uh, put in the, their, op the, their obligations towards the water establishments for the establishment, for those uh, service providers to be sustainable. As a third component is the private sector engagement, and under this component, we have worked in mainly finding the, uh, the enabling environment or uh, find, finding opportunities uh, to uh, in, encourage the private sector to uh, provide services in collaboration with the uh, public sector. However, this also has been addressed in, a, in another means through uh, the uh, farmers and industries because you know for a fact the farmers, uh, the agricultural sector consumes a lot of water and industries, they do require a lot of water. The third component is a, a soft component that basically promotes water, or water stewardship, what we call water stewardship, uh, among private uh, and leading private uh, uh, entities in Lebanon. I will describe each one, uh, each one of the uh, sectors and showcase the exercises that we've done for the past. This, we're actually in our first year now. So uh, regarding public-private partnerships, I mean, the, one would say there's a lot of uh, opportunity uh, examples in Lebanon. Uh, take the, for example, the solid waste management. This is a, a private-public partnership. Take any sort of contract, service contract that the government is having with with a private entity is some kind of a, a private-public partnership. However, uh, the the success rate or the results were not that always optimistic or promising. And there's is, there's this always this stereotype about. Uh, PPP or private-public partnership as some kind of uh, privatization of public uh, public utility. However, uh, this is not the case. This is more of a, a, a cooperative agreement where you can work with the private sector and get the benefits of the um, the services and the know-how that the private that the private sector has. 
So uh, the way we've addressed this, we've we've identified uh, water supply uh, service areas where we uh, see as an opportunity to uh, for the private sector to provide the service in helping reducing non-revenue water, increasing the collection rate. Uh, for for an, as an example, the collection rate in Lebanon does not exceed uh, 60 to 70 percent. Uh, in terms of uh, water supply, it can go up to 80% uh, in the, uh, in the uh, forthcoming years, but uh, you know, the establishments are in need of cash flow for them to operate. So uh, we've incorporated what we call the performance-based contract. So the contract is measured by the outcomes. It's, uh, it's outcome-based, it's not anymore uh, output-based. So, uh, the contractor or the service provider will, will only be remunerated if they perform well. So you set key performance indicators right in the beginning uh, for, the, uh, for the operator to be uh, um, in, um, enticed or to be incentivized, if you want, uh, to perform better. Same thing with the wastewater facilities. We've developed models uh, in order to showcase opportunities for the uh, private sector and the international financial institutions uh, to invest and to help private uh, and to provide private equity loans to operate major facilities. This is the facility in Zahli, for example. It's being it was being commissioned, so we had developed a, a performance-based contract for that. On a, on a on a second note, we have also worked with the establishments in uh, in uh, improving billing and collection and customer database updates through private sector. I'm talking about uh, Cash United, OMT, all those uh, bill collection service providers that can help uh, imp improve by improve the collection by increasing the point of sales and allowing the uh, customers to reach the establishment easier. And the last one would be the showcase is the hydropower plant rehabilitation. Some of the hydropower plants identified are owned by the regional water establishments and they are part of their assets. Some were decommissioned due to administrative and uh, legal issues, and we were looking into opportunities also for the private sector to engage in these. So, uh, going out to uh, the energy and water, the water and energy nexus, I mentioned earlier, uh, the energy has become with the increase of the cost of uh, energy production, and you know uh, for a fact that the government has uh, energy is highly subsidized. Uh, and the establishments, uh, according to the establishment's number, numbers, um, up to 60% of the operational cost of the establishment is mainly an energy cost. So in order to uh, address this uh, challenge, there's uh, several aspects that, we can work, that one can work on. Uh, and th uh, these are examples that we are currently work on, working on, including, uh, sorry, decreasing non-revenue water uh, is, is key. Uh, non-revenue water is the amount of water that is not accounted for, that the establishment is producing, and then eventually uh, they're not uh, generating revenues for. Uh, it is uh, usually average uh, average at 50%. So every cubic meter that you produce, every uh, every cubic meter that reaches the customer, is uh, is uh, there's a twice amount produced at the uh, at the um, production site or at the pumping station. Uh, of course, improved revenues, uh, increased collection, and increased subs subscriptions uh, would also help covering the uh, the energy costs. However. Um, the most important part is to reduce and optimize the cost of production through renewable energy, uh, photovoltaic, and hydropower. Uh, uh, this is an example. We, we came across a hydropower plant that is located, uh, everybody has probably visited the Jrita Grotto, which is a main source of water to, uh, to Beirut, uh, to the district of Beirut. Uh, there's a big channel uh, channeling the water, uh, it's a canal, channeling the water all the way to the Baye uh, pumping station that pumps the water into Beirut. On this canal, there's a 1950 hydropower plant that used to generate uh, energy to be uh, fed into the grid. However, uh, as I've just said, this is an, an 
uh, an asset owned by the water establishment, it can generate 5.4 gigawatt per year. Um, in another term, it is uh, equivalent to 3,000 kVA generators. Uh, and those generators, if you want to operate such generators on diesel fuel, uh, it would average a cost of $800,000 a year. Um, I said it is already uh, hooked to the EDL grid. And it is the opportunity here is that the pumping station is located close to the uh, pumping station, the Jaita pumping station that supplies the upper metan area with water from the Jaita uh, Grotto. So uh, the capital investment required to rehabilitate such a facility is around $3 million. Uh, its OPEX is estimated at $80,000 a year. Imagine three generators to, to, operate it, to operate those generators, you need 800,000. So it's 10 times more. And we, through our calculations, we have identified that this facility can help offset the bill of the Jaita pumping station by at least 40% with a forecasted 60%. The energy bill for the Jaita pumping station, just to give you a scale for that, is around $1.8 million a year. So, and the average payback for the rehabilitation of this facility is 10 years. We, we're presenting these opportunities for the private sector to consider engaging in what we call the DBOT, design, build, operate, and transfer. And then the establishment can go into what we call a, a PPA, a power purchasing agreement. Sorry, I missed. The second component, what we call the, uh, what we have been addressing, uh, that, that we have been addressing is the incentive rebate program. So we help, we incentivized uh, the agricultural sector to uh, consider water saving technologies in their production. Uh, so this mainly fo uh, was focused around uh, field crops, corn, uh, potato, and uh, carrots, where you have, uh, we have integrated the drip irrigation, we've, we've introduced the drip irrigation on these crops, and uh, surprisingly, the crop per drop has drastically increased. Uh, of course, we've, we've also addressed the hydroponics, uh, uh, sorry for the typo. Um, this is mainly to, uh, to produce cash crops uh, like lettuce and um, green, green, greeneries and uh, um, strawberries as well. These technologies, they consume, they consume, they consume much less water than the uh, conventional technologies. The second one is, uh, I will be presenting a short movie for that. It is the water saving technologies with the rock cutting industry, which is uh, a mark, uh, an industry that produces uh, tiles and uh, granite for for the construction, and it generates uh, and it consumes a lot of uh, water, and it generates uh, sludge. And uh, I I will show you the presentation. Okay, last, uh, the water sewer check program, uh, the soft component that I've mentioned, we've encouraged big uh, uh, public institutions in Lebanon, uh, private institutions, I'm sorry, uh, to uh, consider water stewardship in their CSR strategy. Uh, we're talking about like media stations, uh, France Bank, uh, 
uh, Audi Bank and the wineries. And in this uh, stewardship program, we've encouraged comp companies to adopt water saving technologies and to promote water conservations among their customers and within uh, their internal uh, within their internal staffing structure. This is a typical example of a fact sheet developed with France Bank to promote water conservation. And this other one is a campaign uh, run on, the, on TV that uh, reached around a million viewer. And uh, we were back then promoting uh, water saving and hand washing as well prior to the crisis. <laughs> So that's it. And uh, the last slide is a showcase of how meticulous uh, the Haraj hydropower plant were. They were they were measuring the data on a on a daily basis. And this is a sheet that we came across. It is uh, dated back to 1977, almost 43 years ago. So uh, I'm done. And then uh, if there's any questions, I'm I'm here to answer. Okay, thank you, Salah. Uh, uh, so, if anybody wants to ask any question, please post them on Slido. Now, Salah will go and answer them. Uh, Salah, I will share my screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm going through them on uh, okay, on so my phone, but uh, but ah. you can you can share your screen for the others. I I wouldn't okay. mind. So. Uh, somebody asked something about startups. Probably I'm not the one to answer these. Uh, uh, how can we volunteer in these projects? Um, well, uh, it depends on where you are in Lebanon. If you are, uh, I think you can take part of the civic engagement meetings that we're having at the level of municipalities. We've engaged uh, extensively with municipalities through town hall meetings. And uh, this is probably where uh, any any anyone that is knowledgeable and who is interested in in this topic would be would be invited to to attend. Uh, I shared the screen. Okay, I'm I'm okay. Uh, I'd rather go through the ones that any plan for implementing uh, water metering on household level similar to the trial. Yes, I mean I've mentioned this. Uh, it, probably it was brief. We we've we're investing around up to 25 million dollars in uh, pilot projects uh, uh, or uh, demo demo projects the stuff that we mentioned is a is a showcase uh, the we're in, we're in play, we're installing 30,000 household meters and bulk meters related bulk meters and establishing a district metering area in the metan we are also uh, establishing a district metering area for five villages in kura uh, and we have a major as well uh, district metering project and customer metering project in uh, in Jezin. and those meters that were that were introduced are smart meters they can be read remotely and we are currently uh, performing the demand management uh, and to showcase to the establishments how much it is beneficial to monitor and read the customers meters and how much less less water would be consumed and less energy eventually uh, to answer your question about Tripoli, yes, we've looked into this opportunity as a performance-based contract. It is, a, it is in the hands of the establishment. We've developed the model. We even, we even attracted international financial institutions to uh, perform what we call the non-revenue water reduction uh, of, of in and around Tripoli. Um, the opportunity is out there. Uh, the establishments are uh, are looking into uh, uh, in the future to to consider private uh, operators to improve the service perform uh, the water delivery performance in Tripoli. Tripoli were the, was the very first uh, town in Lebanon to have uh, customer meters. <sighs> okay, what? Can else? you please read the question so that we can follow? Oh, okay. I. Uh... From public sector side, focus always seems to be on adding supply more than reducing non-revenue water. Are there non-revenue water reduction projects identified or in the PPP pipeline? Uh, yes, I've mentioned. I mean, the 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 this uh, PPP performance-based contract for Tripoli uh, provided uh, optimistic numbers, if you want financial numbers, and accordingly 
we were trying to uh, uh, encourage encourage uh, private operators to consider uh, providing the service at, in uh, in North Lebanon prior to the crisis. Though, uh, excuse, I was not able to hear about what you exactly did with the Zahli wastewater wastewater water treatment. It's a wastewater treatment station. Okay, we've developed a, a performance-based contract for three major facilities in Debeka uh, to be operated by the private sector. Uh, the facilities are Zahli, Jibjanin, uh, and Sagbin. Um, uh, so it's a large, medium, and small size facility to uh, to attract private sector and for them to for it to be. Uh, economical for the private sector to to, to consider as uh, it's more of an economy of economy of scale. Uh, I was not able. Okay, uh, we have a sorting lab. Can be that developed for energy production. I didn't get the question. This is probably for the yard. Uh, hi, anything about protecting aquifers from saline intrusions? Uh, look, I mean, the way, uh, by, the way we see it, we are indirectly helping by our interventions, helping the, uh, to reduce the uh, overdrawing of groundwater uh, in, in mainly around, in and around Beirut. When you improve water supply, people would not, or the customers would won't rely anymore on the groundwater, and then basically uh, you will be reducing pumping from from groundwater aquifers. What is your plan in decentralized industrial wastewater treatment? Uh, uh, what is your plans in a centralized industrial wastewater treatment? I mean. Uh, the, there are facilities uh, across Lebanon, the big facilities across the coast. We help the establishments uh, draft performance-based based contracts for them to take over those facilities. You should know one thing, the establishments are always afraid or uh, are not eager to take over the, fa the wastewater facilities because there's still this challenge in, in cost rec recovery. So um, the, the opportunity is to the, to, to draft a contract that allows the establishment to get better performance from from the uh, service providers. Uh, okay. What's your opinion about Bisri Dam project? I'm sorry, I'm not the right person to answer this. Uh, this is a controversial topic. I'd rather leave it to uh, to the establishment and to those concerned on this project. Uh, I'm, I'm losing myself on what is the role of municipalities in providing water, or is it solely? Um, uh, the question about, about municipalities, the municipalities, they do have a role. Uh, however, the, the, by lo the law is basically uh, uh, providing the service to the water establishments. However, we've worked extensively under the civic engagement component to create some synergy among the, uh, because eventually uh, municipalities are stakeholders and they can contribute greatly in, in improving the, uh, the, the service provision. Any water meters for, for public going to be enforced? Uh, public schools or, or any, any other facility is uh, considered a customer for the establishment. Uh, excuse, I was not able, okay, sorry, I'm, our uh, meters for public schools, okay, are there, uh, volunteering opportunity, I answered that, how is it, how is the performance of the private operators being measured by the establishments? Uh, it's true, uh, nowadays, the way the establishments are hiring, not, uh, not too generous, but in most cases, the, the water establishments uh, are hiring uh, the service provision, just to uh, have staff, because you know they are short on staff. However, there, haven't, there hasn't been any uh, uh, performance-related uh, key performance indicator, if you want, to make sure that 
the objective of the facility is to treat the water and discharge clean water back into the environment. Okay, so we've tried to integrate those in indicators, and this will encourage the private sector to make sure that whatever effluent they are discharging back into the environment is, is up to the standard. Of course, the challenges, I've, I've jotted down a lot of challenges or opportunities for those who wish to, uh, to consider, like co-composting opportunities, the sludge that is, gener that is generated from, uh, from the uh, wastewater facilities is also an issue uh, that needs to be considered in, in composting. I'll leave this to uh, the, the panelists later on. Um, uh, solar pumping controversy in Lebanon is also an issue. One shouldn't really consider solar pumping either for agriculture or for uh, water supply, drinking water supply, unless there's demand management. Uh, okay. Give examples of KPIs. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the ELVs, the standard environmental discharge uh, values, he has to stick those va to those values. And if he deviates uh, from these values, the he he'd be penalized. And if he doesn't deviate, you give him, you give him uh, a reward. Did Thank I miss you, Yes, okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, and now we would like to welcome Mark Horn. So Mark is the co-founder at Compost Balade and Pubex. Mark is an environmental scientist who worked in the water development department at ESCOA. He also gained knowledge in the field as he worked with national private consulting firm on quantifying pollution source for surface water in Lebanon and solid waste management projects also in Lebanon. So in 2017, he co-founded Compost Balade. Mark is also the founder and CEO of Cubex, a home scale wastewater and solid waste treatment system. So I'm sure he will, uh, he will be talking about it. Mark, can you please uh, share your screen and take it from there? Sure thing. Thank you, Joey. Can you hear me okay, just to make sure? Yes. Okay, great. And you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, let's see. Great. So uh, hello everyone, and um, thank you for this uh, opportunity uh, from Beritech to, to start this uh, e-learning series. Uh, I think this is gonna be very interesting discussions that we're gonna have uh, over the course of the uh, next month at least. Um, today I'll be talking mostly about uh, the second uh, company uh, uh, that was mentioned, that's Cubex, and what we've been doing in relation to, to wastewater. So Compost Bellade uh, initially uh, is, is the mother company, and we focus on uh, converting bio-waste into a bioresource. Our essential goal is to, to valorize that waste into something that can uh, validate the cost of treating it. Uh, in order to ensure its sustainability, even in situations like in Lebanon, where uh, taxes or fees may not directly be uh, uh, the way to, to fund the, the, the system. Um, and here we have a picture of a, a sludging truck uh, working in an informal uh, settlement space, not fully informal, but uh, uh, a tented settlement area. Um, and they are uh, removing sludge from septic tanks. And uh, as uh, Ziad mentioned, a big portion of the country still relies on septic tanks for uh, wastewater treatment. Now, of course, there are a lot of uh, villages that have uh, set up their own treatment systems, as well as uh, some systems that were set up, uh, of course, with funders, uh, and some systems that were set up by the central government uh, in, on the shoreline, as well as in Zahle. Um, however, most of the treatment plants, with the exception probably of Zahli and, uh, and uh, some primary treatment and others, most of them face operational challenges or uh, connection of network. And uh, the challenges are very much related to uh, being able to cover the operational costs of a facility and the, the maintenance needs, of course, uh, given that often there is not uh, an effective taxation system set up. Uh, to uh, recover the, the cost of this, uh, this operation. And uh, I think Salah mentioned this a lot, that uh, there's a key focus on 
uh, non-revenue water and improving the uh, collection of fees and metering water to, to showcase its value better and uh, promote its, uh, it, its better usage and, and its treatment uh, in, a, in an effective manner. But this is gonna, of course, take a long time. We've tried to set up many facilities and we've had some challenges with this uh, uh, in the country. Uh, and moving from septic tanks to uh, centralized or decentralized treatment facilities is also uh, challenging and will face similar challenges. Um, so there needs to be uh, something along the way that can, can, that can allow us to uh, uh, move faster towards uh, solid waste treatment, improved solid waste treatment, uh, sorry, wastewater treatment, and, and focus on having the, the, the bio-waste component uh, treated as well. So um, what we started with uh, is a concept that uh, households generate this wastewater and then the solids that are accumulated uh, end up having to be removed and either sent to a treatment plant, which are very few that treat the solid, uh, or they are dumped usually in uh, streams or um, manholes or any kind of waterway that uh, they can be ridden up in, which is where uh, it has a huge impact on surface uh, water as well as groundwater. And our vision there was that if we can have the water treatment be on site, uh, then effectively uh, we can also have the solids uh, be treated on site and become a biofertilizer. But of course, even with that, we needed an incentive for the user to, to want to invest in having treatment on site. So we, we really want to focus on what kind of value can wastewater bring to the, the home user. So this is where Cubex started uh, to get developed. Uh, essentially, it's a household treatment system that allows the user to recover three key resources from their waste. The first one is biogas from an anaerobic digestion. And uh, the second one is uh, treated water that's uh, suitable for uh, uh, tree irrigation or, uh, or, or irrigation of their, uh, their uh, landscape. And the third one is a biofertilizer, also for the same application. And uh, from there, we, uh, I'd like to talk a bit about the entrepreneurial aspect of things, of how to try to get into the, the wastewater treatment business and uh, the dynamics of all that. So uh, we, we started working with an organization called uh, VNGI. It's the Union of Dutch Municipalities, who were interested in sending, setting up a system for uh, refugee camps in uh, in uh, the Beka Valley, essentially. And when we worked with them, we set up two pilot units. Um, and our vision was taking this waste, essentially, that uh, was being generated and recovered the resources, uh, while also protecting the water streams that are nearby from uh, having to to face the impacts of of uh, desludging. And in that sense, we wanted to eliminate the activity of desludging where somebody has to come remove the solids and uh, instead have it treated on site. So we did install a unit, and you can see here in the picture uh, one of the units being installed. And uh, uh, we had trained the, the users on how to use it, uh, especially uh, how to process their food waste as well as part of the co-digestion in the system to recover even more gas. Um, after applying this project, we really learned a lot about the sector, uh, especially in the tented settlement setting, because for us, uh, at first, we were assuming that we're working with traditional uh, household wastewater, where there are homeowners and they're producing wastewater, uh, but simply because the refugee camps produce much, uh, use much less water or have much less access to water. The uh, waste they produce is much more concentrated and significantly more difficult to treat. And um, in addition to that, because uh, while there is some uh, management of these sites, because there is no ownership of these systems, um, it was not well protected. So children were uh, playing with it, putting stones in it, damaging it in many ways. And uh, that really taught us that we need to create something quite resilient and that uh, the importance of uh, 
having a, a fully well-designed project beyond the system, but even into the who will take care of it. Because at the end, the accountability will, will still be on the, the person that placed it, even though they, uh, they, they sold the product to someone else and they, they installed it for, for someone else. From there, we, we joined an organization called uh, SEWAS, SEWAS Middle East. It's an incubator or a early stage, idea stage incubator for, uh, for startups in the sanitation sector. And they're active in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, you can reach out to them. They have a website. And they're a great place to start in terms of um, uh, learning the business side of uh, getting involved in wastewater treatment and especially in the decentralized uh, setting. And uh, after joining their program, I was able, we were able to connect to uh, SDC, which is the uh, Swiss Development uh, Corporation, and uh, benefit a lot from uh, their network and uh, uh, and group of experts to support us in in how to develop the system further or approach this uh, this this project into becoming something uh, upscalable. And that uh, that really uh, helped us out a lot because from from there we we then uh, joined Agritech that uh, connected us. Uh, we had the a project at least that's consolidated with a business plan and applied to Ag Agritech, uh, which is essentially the older version of or another version of the clean tech program that was launched this year, and uh, received so much support from there and eventually uh, got access to. Uh, experts in the biodigestion field from the, the Netherlands, uh, from a university called Wageningen, uh, that helped us optimize the system for uh, our needs and really uh, improve the, the output. And uh, we took that opportunity also to, to, to redesign the system and deci uh, decide what we would target it for. Uh, and from there, we came up with the, what you see here. Uh, it's a deconstructible unit that can be flat shipped um, with the goal of being able to install or, uh, or remove this uh, unit fairly efficiently and transport it uh, to any location in a cost effective manner. And uh, of course, uh, it's made out of uh, 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 plastic, uh, polypropylene and uh, it's quite uh, uh, resilient to, to uh, decay, but even if it does decay, eventually it is, a, in a way, a recyclable material. And uh, of course, uh, uh, a key part of it, it was how to finance the, the uh, organization or how to finance our startup to be able to conduct these tests and uh, hire some support uh, of course, Baytech had a, a huge role there in, in the prototyping stage where we received some funding, but also we, we uh, needed to uh, apply to competitions and, and try to really reach some uh, grants that, that can allow us to, to go to the next stage. And uh, one of the competitions we won allowed us to uh, attend the, the World Water Week in, in uh, Sweden. That was uh, an amazing opportunity to connect to experts around the world that are working on, on sanitation, uh, especially in the low tech domain where, where you're talking about uh, sanitation in, the, in, a developed, uh, in a developing country uh, and where you have to bypass different challenges related to uh, non-revenue water or, or the uh, political system or the, uh, the uh, poor infrastructure already in place and so forth. Um, and from there, we connected with an organization called Borda. It's a German, German organization that's uh, very focused on uh, low-tech solutions, uh, especially with anaerobic digestion. And we're able uh, to, at the same time, uh, when we came back to, to Lebanon, work with uh, UNICEF, who is managing the wastewater sector uh, for the refugee setting. Um, and really better understand what works for, for their application. And given that um, the, the main issue was on the maintenance side, what we decided to do is upscale the system. Uh, we will continue to produce the system for a household scale, but uh, we also developed an upscaled system 
that would service 250 beneficiaries uh, or uh, tented uh, households or uh, users in, uh, in tented settlements. And um, it, it would allow us to bring the water from a high concentration of, uh, of nutrients or, or pollutants to uh, what the ministry requires in terms of discharge. So uh, combining what we learned from uh, the support that Borda was very kind to offer, given that we're a startup, uh, they, they were more than willing to co cooperate with us and share with us a lot of their, their, uh, their ways, so to speak. We were able to uh, uh, better understand how the sector locally works. And I think that's really crucial uh, to, to get rid of the assumptions we initially had about how things would, uh, would function in the, in the sector. So going Ma? from there, hello? Yes, Mark. Eh, je t'écoute. Oui. Eh, can you please, please share with us a bit, if you want, your journey? Yani, eh, you participated in many accelerators and you took part in many accelerators. Uh, was it always uh, la vie en rose? <laughs> I wouldn't say uh, it was uh, at any point La Vie en Rose. Yeah, it, there's a lot of uh, joy that it brings, of course, to, to achieve different uh, stages in your startup. Uh, but it's a continuous challenge, of course, because you are uh, entering a new, uh, as a new person in the market or a new organization in the market. Uh, and you also have a lot of uh, development internally and on a management level that you need to do, especially if you're a young entrepreneur who doesn't have extensive business experience from the past that you only acquired as a startup. And I think uh, that's where Agritech uh, played an important role on the business side of things, uh, really uh, going from managing a startup like uh, the Kene uh, or like a mini mart uh, and more into a startup and the vision for for scaling even globally. Another question before we answer the Slido question. <laughs> so as you know, we had a very interesting year yani, between uh, COVID-19 and everything that happened before. So how are you coping with the situation as a startup? Um, in terms of a COVID-19 situation, frankly, it, it did affect us in many ways. Um, in terms of an organization, most of our work needed to be on the field, uh, trying to uh, install uh, new units. Uh, we had a contract that I was going to mention now that's uh, related to installation that uh, uh, we got funded by a competition. But a lot of it stopped, of course, and that really affects our ability to go on to the next stage. But a lot of measures that were done to re-strategize uh, allowed us to, to, to um, well, still uh, be able to work now. And that was related to uh, the, the strategy. So essentially, today, we, we shifted our, our focus uh, from working with households directly to more focus on uh, the work with the development agencies that we've been doing. Um, and that is because today of the uh, economic situation, of course, from one end and from a second end, it's uh, the private sector is a bit at a halt given the circumstances. But in terms of uh, tenders and applying to uh, to uh, opportunities to implement projects, uh, it's still active on the development sector side. So now we're in a preparation phase. We're applying to bids. Uh, to uh, implement different projects uh, using our methods. However, uh, anything related to implementation has been at a halt. Okay, so now I'm sharing the questions, okay? You can, uh, you can see them, right? Because we still have right. five minutes and I need to move to the other session. Sure, sure. So what's your advice to newly graduated? Shall they join Veritech? So I think there are a lot of options that Veritech offers. One of them uh, is the hackathons and ideathons. And I think those are very uh, beneficial for you to uh, test your idea. And I would say if uh, you are a fresh graduate, uh, definitely make sure you, you, you're coming with a team and you connect with other people that have other skills. Uh, 
uh, not necessarily from your same class, but uh, engage even with Beritech and, and those programs, and you might meet the people that uh, are suitable partners for the project. So definitely uh, engage with them. I'm not sure if as a fresh graduate, it makes the most sense to jump into the clean tech program. You will benefit from it, but not as much as if you've gone through something that's more of a incubation uh, phase first. Okay, so we have another question. Can the units be installed in houses? So directly? Yes, so the units are made to re replace a septic tank in a rural area. Of course, there is a, a one limitation that if the septic tank is somehow installed under concrete in a very difficult area, we might have some challenges uh, in replacing it. But essentially, wherever you have a septic tank or are installing a new house, it can be installed there. Okay. Um, how do you manage the energy expenses related to your system and informant settlements? Okay, so there, was, uh, there were some criteria that were set by one of the uh, organizations in terms of energy demand per beneficiary. Uh, and what we've done is using anaerobic digestion, which is uh, very minimal on energy demand compared to the uh, aerobic phase. We focused on re reducing a big part of the the uh, uh, essentially BOD and, and, and COD contents through the anaerobic phase. And uh, the remaining energy demand that's of course always there even with the pumping and, and so forth, it's, it's covered by the, uh, um, the, the camp. So the, the camp is actually uh, the fees are either paid by the development agency that's managing that camp or uh, by the beneficiaries of that camp, depending on the municipality and the meters that are in place. So we, we abide by certain energy demand uh, that they set in place. Okay, so what is the cost of such a unit and effective to how many people? Well, currently uh, the unit is about $5,000. Uh, of course, there's installation after that, depending on the location, but usually the preparations for the installations can be done by the, the a local uh, excavator or something like that. Um, and the unit services uh, five people or five households where the water consumption is between 170 and 200 liters per day per person. Okay, we have uh, another uh a recommendation, you should try to build one unit with Ziad Abishakir's uh, eco boards. They are waterproof and it's recycled plastics. <laughs> um, I, I would be happy to, frankly. Um, usually the, the challenge with uh, the tanks is having a good uh, water seal because uh, it's quite tricky, especially that it's submersible underground. underground. But uh, yes, uh, I think that's a great idea. Okay, what's the name of the early idea incubator in sanitation you mentioned? Uh, it's called SEWAS, so it's C-E-W-A-S. I don't know if uh, you can type yes, it in definitely. and maybe share Hannah's uh, contact. Yes, uh, definitely. Great. Okay, I, I will do this uh, on... Uh, the German organization is called Borda, B-O-R-D-A. Uh, Okay, so is there any residue from this whole operation or is it a whole operation where nothing is left and all is useful? That's a, a good question in a way. Of course, everything is uh, uh, intended to be reused in the, in the process. Now, uh, some things that, will, that change based on where the system is installed are, for example, the, the gas that's being produced. In the case of the refugee setting, uh, because the, there is a risk, uh, they, they see this as a hazard in the development uh, sector for, for refugee setting, we just dissipate the gas and, and treat it using, uh, using a biofilter and discharge it without reuse. So in a way, it, it does become a, a residue that's being discharged. But in the household setup, we're setting it up where the user can benefit from that gas. The water can be used for irrigation, uh, so also can be discharged, but preferred to be used in irrigation. In the winter time, it will probably be discharged. And uh, uh, 
and the compost, of course, that also depends if you have a use for it or not, but essentially it becomes stabilized enough to, to use on certain uh, uh, plant applications. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Do you want to add uh, anything else or can we move to the third and last session? I think we can move on. Uh, thank you, everyone. And of course, you can reach out to us uh, at any point if you have some ideas. I wanted to recommend two things actually real quick, if you don't mind, uh, for people seeking to get into the sector. Uh, I see two interesting opportunities. The first one is related to uh, household and uh, farmer uh, water saving features. Um, and, but of course, the key is for uh, entrepreneurs to look at alternative business models where the user doesn't have to pay uh, upfront for these uh, water saving features, but you offer it in a service. Uh, we've learned a lot that with, with water, people tend to prefer a service than an infrastructure. Um, and I think you, the that if we focus on that, there's a lot of opportunities that can be created in terms of uh, water treatment or uh, water supply business models. So that's just a, a quick one for, for entrepreneurs out there. We can't hear you, Joey. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you so much. Pleasure. And, uh, also, I want to uh, thank the previous uh, panelists as well. So Salah Saliba and Ziad Abishakir as well. Now we will be starting the third uh, session. Um, I just wanted to see how many people just uh, joined the call so you can actually vote and uh, raise your hand. So. Uh, if you can do this in the next uh, minute, it will be great so that we know if you can jump in directly into the third session. Okay, so we have around uh, 25 that just joined and it's still, uh, so, uh, so okay. So we'll do the presentation again. So for the people that were already there and want to continue the session, you have seven minutes as well. Um, you can just go to whatever you want and then you can join us so that you can continue from there. Okay, so we'll be back in uh, seven minutes and I, I will start uh, presenting the, the series now. So for the new uh, comers, uh, hello. We are very happy to have you with us in this very first edition of the Clean Tech Learning Series. Um, we hope you are doing safe and we're taking now this time uh, mainly to plan for a better future, hopefully. So some people might, uh, might have asked why we are running the clean tech learning series. Well, we believe that now is the time to think on how to improve our lives in the near future, as this is not anymore uh, a choice, but unfortunately, this is now an obligation towards uh, our planet. Uh, we will eventually need to earth uh, to sustain the way we are living today by 2030. So there has never been a more urgent need for clean, sustainable solutions in waste, water, energy, transportation, and agriculture than today. Our country has suffered enough from high deterioration in the infrastructure and hygiene sectors and high cost of operating and consuming energy and water, among many other things. So today we are aiming to create a community of entrepreneurs, experts, partners, NGOs, public and private sectors to help and support in the creation of startups that will be able to answer not only uh, the uh, local challenges, but also regional and international needs in the sector. So the Clean Tech Learning Sessions are organized by Beritech under the Clean Energy Program, and it's funded by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Lebanon. Uh, through this program, uh, Beritech will offer the startups the resources, knowledge, support, and funding necessary to scale and grow. I will explain uh, briefly about the accelerator, so the Clean Energy Accelerator. Uh, you can go on beritech.org uh, programs 
Clinergy, you can uh, read in details about it. So I'll just go through it briefly. Uh, mainly what we will be doing in the Clinergy Accelerator, we will be supporting solutions that are tackling challenges in the clean tech sector. So when we say clean tech, we're talking about agriculture, transportation, energy, uh, water, water, uh, wastewater management, and waste management as well. So the accelerator is divided into uh, three phases. In the first phase, uh, and probably will be starting end of July this year, uh, we will take up to 24 teams uh, to support them with their innovative ideas in the clean tech sector by providing them $2,000 in grants to validate and ensure the products are fit to the market. From these 24 teams, we will take up to uh, 12 teams to join us in the second phase. So the second phase is the acceleration phase. They will get up to $15,000 in support grants to build their MVP, minimum viable product, and test it with early adopters. From these 12 teams, uh, we will uh, select up to eight to join the last phase, which is the incubation and growth phase. Uh, to help them scale and, uh, and we will help them by providing $20,000 in matching grants. So the Clean Energy Accelerator will run over two batches. The first one, as I said before, will uh, be starting probably in July. So the deadline to apply is uh, on uh, June 7. Uh, if you think you have an innovative solution in the clean tech sector, I urge you to go and check the website and submit your application so we can help you make the world a better place. So back to the clean tech learning sessions. Uh, the goal of these sessions mainly is to provide enough material for the entrepreneurs to answer the existing challenges in the clean tech sectors with innovative solutions. And also we want to create a community around the sector to support these entrepreneurs especially that investment in the sector are rising and the challenges could only mean business opportunities for innovative entrepreneurs solving challenges in the clean tech sector. So the clean technology learning series will happen every Tuesday in April on Zoom. And uh, every week we will have uh, different guest speakers and entrepreneurs discussing uh, the challenges they are facing in the clean tech sector and their solutions as well, what they are doing to solve uh, these challenges. So uh, we will be tackling specifically uh, waste management, water and waste management, and wastewater management, and last but not least, renewable energy. At the end of the session, we will open the door for a Q&A session for both the guest speaker and the entrepreneur. We already shared in the dialogue uh, box uh, the link that you can use to ask your question on Slido. We'll do it again now. So you just go on Slido, put the code and ask your questions. And then the experts and the entrepreneur would be able to answer your questions there. Um, so now uh, we are starting the third uh, session of this webinar. So we are in our third hour now. And we will be talking about renewable energy with two uh, guest speakers. So we have uh, Hassan Harajli and Antoine Skaye. So we will start uh, first with our expert in renewable energy, Hassan Harajli, who will be uh, talking about expanding localized energy opportunities. So disconnect to connect. Hassan is the project manager of the UNDP CIDRO project and has been uh, UNDP energy and advisor since uh, 2009. He's a holder of a PhD in renewable energy policy and economics and has an MS in environmental technology. He has several peer reviewed publications and several years of experience in environment, environment related consultancy. He also uh, lectures part time at AUB in energy policy economics, planning and policy and environmental economics. Hassan, thank you uh, for being with, with us today. So we are glad to have you on board and I will leave you now to lead on your presentation if you want to share your screen or just uh, uh, Let me just, um, okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I would like to first start with thanking uh, very much Baytech for this opportunity 
to join the Team Technology Learning Series. Um, <clears throat> I'll be discussing in particular uh, distributed uh, renewable energy uh, resources. Um, so I'm sure you can see my screen, right? So I can start. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, so basically with a, I'll start with a bit of a background on, on things that we are all living at the moment and we're all experiencing, so I won't take my time in it. We know for a fact that um, the power generation units in Lebanon uh, do not cater for our demand uh, for our uh, demand for power, and this demand uh, has been forecasted to increase in the future. I don't know. Uh, I don't know now with the coronavirus what will happen, but um, uh, demand is forecasted to increase. Um, the um, the problem with our power generation units is that. Um, they have very high operational costs. Many of them are running on heavy fuel oil and diesel oil, uh, but some power plants were designed to run on natural gas, which lowers the efficiency of these plants. And running on uh, diesel and uh, fuel oil is uh, a rather very expensive way to generate electricity. Um, the, the, our plants are mostly old. Uh, they've been around for too long. Some of them should be retired by now, but they keep on extending their uh, lifetime. Um, and when a, when a unit of electricity leaves this particular plant, any particular plant, unfortunately it loses uh, around 16, 17% due to the, uh, uh, the poor quality of our network, which needs significant upgrades. And another 21%, uh, uh, they name it non-technical losses, but this is basically uh, the theft of ele electricity. Another 5% um, are electricity being consumed, but not being paid for. And you know, some institutions in Lebanon are exempt from paying uh, uh, electricity, or they haven't done it for uh, such a long time. Um, to compensate this def deficit, most of us, if we can afford it, uh, we uh, rent out power from neighborhood uh, diesel uh, gensets, and this puts significant burden on our household income. Um, the economic impact of, uh, of this power system, well, since the 1990s, since the end of the war, we've been transferring on average between one to two billion dollars uh, to EDL every year. And today, 40 to 45 percent of our national debt, uh, the debt that we have uh, finally uh, come to realization that we cannot repay anymore and we have defaulted, is mainly due to the subsidies given to the, to the power sector. So with this system, we have high import dependence. We import around 97 to 98 percent of our primary energy needs. Um, and we have a loss of hard currency. And these days, you know how valuable uh, hard currency is. Uh, buying oil from outside, buying fuel, uh, means that our hard currency that we can uh, achieve by exporting industrial goods, by tourism, by, by so many other, other things, um, uh, we are losing that by buying fuel. Um, and of course, this is loss of employment, development, and opportunity as well. Every dollar that leaves is a dollar not spent in the country, a uh, dollar lost to economic development and growth. Um, diesel and fuel oil and the, the inefficiency of the power system, they have significant ecological and health impacts as well, especially neighborhood uh, diesel generators that are running uh, just very, very, very close to us. And so the health implications are uh, significant. Um, unfortunately, the sector, uh, the governance of the sector uh, needs reform. We need the regulatory authority, we need better sector management, we need the utility EDL reform and what have you. And since the 1990s, we've been waiting for this reform. There's a lot of talk on reform, there's been laws out there that have not been implemented. So it's, it's basically a, a, a big mess and it, and it has caused 
half of the problem why we're here almost is because of this energy sector. So given this background, um, what, what is one possible way, what can we do uh, as individuals, as entrepreneurs uh, to try to mitigate this uh, situation? Well, basically, I'd like to start with something. Um, usually, we, go to, we can go to supermarkets uh, and buy vegetables, fruits, and what have you. And we may not know where these vegetables are, are coming from. But suppose that you have the option to buy uh, local uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, many of us will decide perhaps to buy local, especially if, that, or, uh, especially if we're living in villages and towns that we know that this is coming from our town or from our village and we sometimes see uh, the farmers and what have you um, going about their agricultural business. Another example is uh, meat. And uh, um, in this case also that many times our food, we don't know where it's coming from. We just go to a supermarket, we, uh, we buy this meat uh, and we have no idea how it's been processed and what have you. But again, um, if we can get it from a local uh, butcher um, that sources the meat from a local farmer, um, maybe we'll be more connected to the food that we are eating. And so I'm saying this because then why not also the same thing can happen with, the, with, with our energy. We need to also get close to our energy, not too close, of course, but <laughs> close enough. Our energy comes from faraway places. It's uh, extracting oil and gas, uh, well, basically oil uh, from the earth. And, you, and we all know what, what this is doing uh, to our climate. And it needs um, to go to refineries sometimes. Uh, then it comes to our generation plan, transmission, distribution, and to our house. But why, why can't we generate power uh, on site? for each house, they can generate their own power. And this is the focus of this presentation. So distributed generation is very, very important. And it's very important for many reasons, but I'd like to focus on one particular reason. This particular pyramid you see here shows the distribution of wealth in the world. And you will see almost that around 9.5% of people worldwide, worldwide uh, control around um, around 85% of the wealth of the world. And this issue also is very uh, acute in Lebanon as well. If you look at these two, two graphs, we see that the bottom 50% of income groups, you know, their share of wealth have dropped uh, over, over the years um, to, 11, to, to 11%. And the top 1% also have a control of uh, disproportionate share of our national income. Now, in the power sector, this is, this is a problem um, because, and as something that Ziad said before, the concentration of money is the concentration of, of power. Our, our electricity system is, is almost a 2.53 plus billion dollar industry a year. And, um, this money mostly goes to cost of fuel that we are uh, buying from, from outside. So what we need to do really is find a way as much as we can on an individual level to create opportunities to disconnect from the system as much as possible until hopefully Lebanon gets its act together and improves the system or, or they go together distributed and the larger scale uh, renewable energy systems or the conventional energy systems. So, and I'm not talking here about the social and environmental implications of shifting from this particular system here to, to one which is more reliant on sustainable sources of energy. Basically, distributed low carbon technologies, there are several uh, different types. Uh, you know, we have the, the usual ones, we know very well the solar hot water, uh, we also know now the solar photovoltaic and uh, to generate electricity. And the cost of that has been dropping down drastically. Uh, since 10 years to, to now, uh, it has completely shifted from being one of the most expensive ways to generate power to one of the cheapest ways. But there are other sources as well, like microwind, like Pico Hydro, if you have a water uh, stream running next to you or a 
water from non-river sources as well. Um, you have heat pumps, whether uh, ground source heat pumps or air source heat pumps that can provide heating and cooling and hot water using uh, much more, uh, using electricity much more efficiently. And of course, you have um, uh, biomass of different sorts and types and biogas. And one example was given to us by, uh, by Mark uh, uh, earlier on. Um, but the big question with these technologies really is, can they satisfy most of our residential and commercial energy needs at all times throughout the seasons, day and night? And if they can, what will it cost us uh, for them to provide us this power? And, and this is an issue because many of these technologies, as we know, are, are variable. The sun doesn't shine at night, uh, clouds pass by in winter, uh, the, the sun is, is, uh, is more dim and same thing with, with wind and what have you. Um, so um, really, are enabling technologies that I'll discuss in the next slides that will uh, constantly increase our ability to make use of these technologies to satisfy more and more of our energy needs. And so here, the first thing that I would like uh, uh, innovators to know is that innovations in distributed energy technology is, all, is an ongoing process, it, it never stops. You have to improve the costs, the efficiency of these systems, the lifetime of these systems. You can maybe create new systems, I don't know. And this is a part that you may think is difficult. It needs a lot of funding, a lot of thinking and all that. But it is a question that you have to keep in mind. Can we play a part in Lebanon? Can we create something here? Um, now, moving to enabling uh, technologies, I will talk about two enabling technologies. The first one is battery storage and uh, the, the power to, to X. Basically, um, battery and power to X are our ability to take power at a certain moment where we have excess power. We don't need it. Like the wind is blowing a lot or the sun is shining a lot, but we don't need that power. If we can take that power and store it, then we can use it at times when our demand is high or, or the wind is not blowing well enough or the sun is not shining well enough. So we have different kinds of uh, technologies, electrochemical technologies like lithium is the most uh, famous of those. We have ele electromechanical, like a compressed air storage, as an example. Um, we have chemical. Hydrogen is uh, one that's uh, that's been given a lot of been given a lot of attention. Liquid air energy storage as well. Uh, there's hydropower, uh, uh, like Salah talked about, but this time you store the hydro at a, uh, at a higher level and you release it when you need the electricity. Um, and at the end, there's thermal storage. So you can use uh, chilled water, heat, mountain salt, and, and what have you uh, as well. All these technologies that we see here are also um, facing or being subjected to immense investments, immense innovation, to improve their cost, their efficiency, their lifetime, their, 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 their applicability. Some of them are only for, for larger scale power, but not for smaller scale and vice versa. So um, there is also opportunity here to, to further uh, investigate these very important enabling technologies and storage um, and, um, and possibly have a hand to play in this sector. The second enabling technologies is the uh, digital technologies. Um, we all heard of Internet of Things, uh, the ability to, to use real-time communication via the Internet, of course, to connect various devices with each other, to, to better manage uh, these uh, devices and how we, we use them, to integrate demand-side management, as an example, and also to forecast renewable energy, and also, if you, perhaps in the future, to also trade in renewable energy. Another one is artificial intelligence and, and, and big data. Um, I've read a lot about uh, how forecasting renewable energy using different sensors and different data are, are being, the data is being used and 
put into artificial intelligence uh, systems or processes so that they can learn uh, how the prison uh, was done, what did it say, and what was the real outcome, and try to see what were the errors uh, of having a different outcome from the prediction, and trying to learn from this and improve the accuracy of future predictions. The last one I'll talk about is blockchain, and this, uh, this is a distribution ledger technology which records all the transaction on a, on a network without a, a middleman involved. And this opens a way to, for, for private to private sale of, of, uh, of electricity. And it opens a way for so many other applications as well. So here, this is a, a very um, an evolving sector. Also, a lot of innovation, a lot of investment is going into this sector. And it's, it's interesting for us as Lebanese also, or, or uh, the region to also look at uh, these things and see if we can also play a part in them. Um, but in Lebanon, uh, sorry, there's a chat. Uh, okay. In Lebanon, we have some barriers. Uh, many of these technologies I just mentioned above, these, these three, for example, they require um, new innovative business models, uh, like allowing private to private, peer to peer trade of power, allowing community ownership of power, um, uh, also pay-as-you-go models, et cetera. I know that the EBRD and the Ministry of Energy and Water and EDL are working on a new draft law for distributed renewable energy generation. Uh, this will take time, but it will be very helpful. And uh, perhaps they will allow net metering in all its forms and facets. Um, so if you have a, if you have a, a factory or a house in, uh, in the city in Beirut, you can install a new energy in the Beka, and the utility has to account for that power in Beka to your house in, in Beirut. Uh, but these things require a strong institutional endowment. Uh, the utility must be strong, flexible, um, um, a regulatory framework must be available, and a political processes must be efficient as well. Unfortunately, to date, uh, these things are lacking. So many of the technologies that will rely on the network and will rely on EDL uh, to, uh, to cater for these, we're going to find difficulties in them. And um, EDL is, uh, has so much problems. It has exceptional people, hardworking people, but they're overloaded. It should be, it should hire new staff uh, where they need the most. It should be reformed, and uh, should be uh, really uh, enabled to cater for a new world. It's no longer the big power plants giving power through the network to you, to your household, to your factory, to to whatever. Uh, no, now you are able to, to produce power and send it into the network as well. So until that moment, I think we have to depend a lot on systems and innovations that will increase the independence of households or companies or what have you in generating their own electricity. And this is the hierarchy. Any innovation that can stimulate us to save energy, to increase energy efficiency, and then to include renewables Will, uh, will give us a lot of benefit uh, to become more energy independent. My last slide is, of course, distributed renewable energy generators and technologies should not be installed on houses or firms or companies that are inefficient. So efficiency has to come uh, first. And any innovation that relies on efficiency we need to nudge behavior, nudge our behavior as, as uh, humans, as people. And we have some biases and it's not easy. Uh, we like to stick to the status quo. If you buy a washing machine, for example, and the default setting is put on, I don't know, the, uh, the most wasteful cycle, chances are you're gonna keep it there. Whereas if the washing machine comes and it's put on a green cycle, chances are that, that you're also gonna keep it on the green cycle. We as humans don't like to, exer to exert a lot of effort. You know, we, uh, we just go for what's uh, satisfactory. We don't wanna work our minds 
too much. So any solution that we create has to take that into account as well. Things that we paid for currently that we have in our houses, we may be attached to and we find it difficult to, to change. So we have to incentivize people to change their uh, behavior. And we also discount a lot. So we hear this a lot many times in industries and in households, whatever, we, when you want to buy stuff and you say to, to people, this will save you a lot of money, uh, it will pay you back in two years, three years, um, they might not be too interested. They want things back very soon because they discount the future. Last but not least also, we, uh, we have so many things in our lives. So anything that's created that, uh, that should shift our behavior, should really focus on uh, giving us, it's called availability bias, giving us signals. For example, if you have like a traffic light home in some places, small lights, if it goes red, you know you're consuming a lot of electricity, then you instinctively will start to turn off power so it goes back to orange. So also here is a lot of innovations and uh, uh, in energy efficiency and nudging uh, behavior and this is also an important uh, issue as well so yes that's it thank you Hassan thank you for this great intervention so now we will go uh, we will answer uh, uh, some questions uh, before that we received a question about if uh, they were not able to watch the entire webinar so you can go on the cleantech agritech community group I will share the link now in a few. We are live on Facebook, so I think you can uh, you can uh, catch the presentation again. I'll share now my screen so that you can go through the questions. Okay. So just a, a reminder: if you guys have any question, please. Uh, use Slido so that you can answer. Uh, we have a question. Uh, what are the government support for the solar energy projects? Um, basically, the government has a net metering program uh, in place. The implementation is not very effective at the moment, but what this means is that if you have a solar system uh, installed on your home to generate electricity, uh, you can export the excess amount that you're not using. Uh, in that electricity to, to the grid, and the government then is supposed to come in and bill you for the net amount. So it will subtract uh, what you gave it from what you took from the government and only bill you for this uh, net amount. Um, other things support, uh, there's the LIREF, uh, soft loan mechanism at the moment. So you can go take a soft loan with very low interest uh, uh, to install any renewable energy system at the moment. Now it's a bit stalled because of the banking crisis, but hopefully it will start uh, going again very soon. Uh, are there any books you recommend on RE or going off the grid for houses? You know, there's so much information out there and really I just recommend that you, um, you log on the internet and you see all, all these things, but definitely, um, uh, try to get them from uh, known sources uh, to understand this. And you have to understand the cost of going completely off-grid. It's not easy. And this is why innovation is required. Can we join any international community on clean energy projects? What's the role of the UN in that? Well, uh, we at the UNDP have been working since 2007 uh, to promote sustainable energy by demonstrating various projects, uh, uh, across the country, solar PV, uh, biomass, uh, micro wind, energy efficiency. We've done a lot of studies as well uh, on uh, our natural resources in Lebanon. How much do we have wind? How much do we have solar? How much do we have uh, biomass? And we do a lot of lobbying uh, and policy advocacy with the government. You can check our website, uh, CEDRO uh, UNDP, and you can see all our, our publications there as well. So the, the UN has a vital role to play. Remember, it's the UN FCCC that organizes the climate change uh, uh, negotiations. 
and it's the one that really promoted the Paris Agreement, and Lebanon has committed to reach 20% renewable energy uh, by 2030. I think I've lost the screen. I'll try to go to. Okay. Um, thank you once again, Hassan. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now I would like to welcome Antoine Skayen. But before that, uh, we would be sharing. Uh, so you can review all the presentation on this link. Okay. So we have a group for the agri tech and clean tech. So you can go there and check again the presentation and so on. Okay. So. Uh, Okay, I think we're here. Uh, so now I would like to welcome Antoine Neskayim, who is the CEO at Free Energy. Antoine is a certified measurement and verification professional and green energy finance uh, specialist from the Renewable Academy in Berlin. He is the CEO of Free Energy, a firm specialized in customizing renewable and energy efficiency solution and founding member of uh, Riego, an agri-tech solution that manages water consumption. He is an environmental and outdoor enthusiast. He started free energy in uh, 2012 as a direct response to the drastic energy situation in Lebanon and has since led it through a successful acquisition. Uh, thank you, Antoine. So I leave you to lead on the presentation now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Too loud, well, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's perfect. Okay, cool. Am I sharing the screen properly? Or la, la? Not yet, la. okay. Oh. Well, my screen is still on, so I no, my screen is not on. Yeah, you can. Okay, it's working now. Can you see the yes. presentation? Okay, cool. Uh, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar. Always a great pleasure to be part of Veritech activities. Um, so I was asked to share my journey and uh, this is what I'm gonna do in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, my journey started back in 2012 in India, actually. Uh, I was, um, uh, I joined an NGO. We were going around the northern part of uh, the Himalayas, basically on the Chinese and uh, Pakistani border. And this is where I learned to install small off-grid systems to monasteries, remote monasteries. This is where the story started. This is where uh, I got in love with, uh, with this technology and um, really understood the great value uh, it, uh, it brought to these remote areas. And I decided to uh, go back home and uh, do something about it. And in 2012, uh, uh, there were the main pillars uh, in the Lebanese uh, ecosystem for uh, such a business to start. Um, the central bank launched a subsidized loan back then, so financing was there because uh, you need financing uh, uh, to uh, make such projects attractive because they have a high capex. Net metering was already established uh, by the ministry with EDL and net metering allows uh, a beneficiary who installs a solar project or any renewable energy project to pump the energy back to the grid. Uh, and uh, have a credit debit system, basically. Uh, so there's the legal, the regulation aspect of uh, the business. It was already coming set up. In addition, uh, the cost of energy in Lebanon is extremely high. We pay two to three energy bills a month, uh, and it's unreliable. So these three constitu constituents uh, were the right uh, pillars to start uh, such a business. 
uh, I was driven to start. I had no idea what I was doing, but I wanted to reduce the energy demand. I wanted to reduce the carbon emissions. I wanted to contribute to my community, to my, uh, to my environment, and to increase the resilience of the Lebanese economy and to retain talent. And I just started and had no idea what I'm doing. Uh, for example, I did not register the company at first. I was going around hunting projects. And then one day, one of the clients actually gave me a check addressed to the name of the company. I had a logo, basically, and a name. And when I went to the bank to cash in the check, he told me, yeah, but you need to stamp uh, the check to, to cash it in. And uh, I went to get a stamp and uh, the guy at the library told me, I need your commercial registry. So I told them, okay, I'll be back in a week. And this is when I contacted a lawyer to register the company. This is how much I had no clue what I'm doing. But I learned as, as, uh, as I uh, went forward. Um, so uh, uh, basically, uh, we started with zero investment and the company started growing organically. Um, we recruited the first employee, uh, got a small shop, got a vehicle from the profit generated. Eventually, the vision started to, sh to, 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 to shape and the company started growing and gaining market share. And this is where um, I realized that energy is the present, but the future lies in the water, energy and food nexus. And this is where we started uh, packaging our solutions uh, and customizing solutions to cater for our beneficiaries' needs rather than uh, selling solutions of the shelf or products. And uh, we got the chance with arc ciel to really learn and prove uh, that we can deliver. And we had a very successful project uh, in energy consulting and we did a solar PV project on-grid, off-grid. Um, and, um, and in 2013, 2014, there was a devastating drought while we were doing these energy projects. And that drought really devastated their uh, agricultural yield. And uh, we just sat down and started thinking of different ways uh, to really uh, manage the, the water uh, consumption. Um, and uh, we came up with a matrix of solutions where we uh, installed sensors that monitor uh, some monitored the weather, the crops, the soil, and, uh, and this is how a spin-off from Free uh, started taking, uh, taking shape, and it was uh, Riego. Uh, so in 2014, uh, there was a spin-off service that we started, uh, and Riego was a solution that we developed. Uh, it's a matrix of sensors that monitor the soil, the crops, and the weather parameters. Uh, and our uh, special spice was the fact that uh, we were able to integrate a machine learning uh, algorithm that was able to, with time, uh, reduce and uh, reduce the the water uh, water consumption. Um, Diego Diego started to pick up uh, momentum uh, uh, after BDL uh, introduced the 331 uh, circular. And uh, there, were, there were plenty of, of action in the ecosystem. And we were very lucky to be under Beritech's uh, wings uh, for a while. Um, Diego did have a proof of concept. We won several competitions. Beritech helped us forge uh, our skills, improve and stress our business model. Uh, they supported us on, uh, co uh, on competitions uh, internationally and regionally. And, uh, we were exposed to different cultures, different mindsets, and uh, that was that was crucial to my personal growth and uh, and everyone uh, supporting me uh, at that time. However, Diego did not see the light as a startup on its own. It was always a service provided by Free. It was never able to be independent. Uh, we did a few uh, timid uh, projects. Uh, one that I would like to mention here was with uh, Chateau Xara, where we developed uh, a matrix of sensors that monitored the soil uh, temperature. And it was a very successful project and it's still being used till now. And they use it to uh, know when to harvest the grapes and monitor the acidity level and how much they're stressing uh, uh, the soil. 
Uh, in 2016, uh, we started uh, really feeling uh, first signs of stress of the Lebanese market. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, one of the main pillars of a renewable energy market is uh, financial subsidies or, or financial or soft loans or uh, incentives, financial incentives. And uh, in 2016, uh, commercial banks started being to be reluctant, reluctant on uh, giving out loans, started taking more time. Um, they, weren't, uh, they were making it really hard uh, to access uh, financing, although they were advertising that they were. And that was really stressing our cash flow and our growth. Uh, as a result, uh, I knew that uh, there is a big need to, to leave uh, uh, the Lebanese uh, uh, market and, and start looking uh, elsewhere. It was a great market to learn because there's a big diversity, especially in energy. If you have the remote off-grid, you have the grid uh, tied, you have the fuel saver uh, solution where you tie to generators and EDL. So we really uh, broadened our spectrum technically but uh, projects are small, it's, uh, the, the access to finance is, uh, is very tough, and uh, it's, it's, an un it's un unstable politically, so there's always action. And sometimes the BDL changes the circular and the banks did not approve, and then you have like six, seven months of just waiting, and uh, 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 the BDL uh, closes from November till February, uh, and you can't get loans. And, so these types of uncertainties really were, were stressing uh, the model. So started working towards uh, uh, getting on board uh, investors that will help, help us grow um, and expand. Because starting a company was an easy game because you have nothing to lose. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, okay, uh, you just wasted some time and you tried. However, when you have something going on for years with references and clients, and expectations are high um, and start in taking projects of significant size, you have plenty to lose and uh, a mistake will cost a lot. So scaling a company is a different ball game and uh, it requires help, help on financial side, on mentoring, uh, on business aspect and uh, opening network and doors. And uh, uh, I had several opportunities and options and I believe I was very lucky with the current board that I have that's really helping me out uh, their hands on helping me in strategic decisions, not only in, uh, in financing. So after the acquisition, we were really able to uh, refine our, uh, our team and skills and with the experience that we got from Riego in parallel. And I'll tell you a small story about Riego later on that, that we're still using today, by the way. Um, we started getting uh, decent references in the country, and this is one of the biggest private uh, solar references in Lebanon, where we did a consulting job. We, uh, we, uh, we installed, uh, it's a more than one megawatt uh, tied to the generators. So Demco had five generators to operate the factory, and now they only use one to two generators. Um, we, we also um, took the mandate to conduct the energy audit for and indoor air quality for the three ABC malls. And we're very proud that they're all already implementing a lot of the solutions that we suggested. Um, and with the help of our board in 2018, we were able to forge a partnership with uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, families in, in Saudi Arabia, the Zamin, uh, which we're very proud to have. And we started exploring the Saudi market in parallel while really growing the business in Lebanon. Uh, however, the collapse in 2019 really expedited the jump to uh, Saudi Arabia and we had to pivot and we were able to put an action plan. And the action plan constituted of doing only consulting jobs in, uh, in Lebanon and refrain from any contracting work uh, to hedge on uh, risk. Uh, in addition to uh, pivoting uh, the model in Saudi Arabia to more of an energy as a service type of model. And in uh, no time, we were able to secure uh, two decent uh, deals in uh, Lebanon, consulting deals, uh, in addition to two projects in uh, Saudi, uh, one on consulting and one on uh, solar, in addition to forging a consortium with an international firm to explore the energy as a service market in KSA. And here we are now.
So uh, with Corona, uh, uh, we were able to continue working on the already projects, uh, on the already signed projects. We weren't heavily affected uh, because the Lebanese market collapse actually helped in this regard because uh, we already stopped the, most of the site work. And our business um, model is based on remote work, like the office was always there, but for brainstorming or in case you want to go there. But our setup was always dependent on online tools and cloud, cloud-based. So uh, business continued as usual. Uh, the only thing we did not uh, take into uh, uh, consideration was uh, border lockdown. So currently I'm locked down in uh, Dubai because I was not able to enter Saudi before they locked the border. One of our team uh, members and colleague is, is locked in Dammam uh, because he was not able to get out before they uh, locked the border and the rest of the team is in uh, Lebanon. But we continued uh, working, basically. We haven't stopped till today. We still have, I think, uh, a month or two uh, worth of uh, work. And, uh, and this is our story till, till today. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, now I will share my screen so that you can go through the questions. OK, I think we have around five. Here we go. Okay, so what pushed you into renewable energy? Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, what pushed me into renewable is really contributing to uh, the Lebanese situation, reducing the energy demand, uh, creating value for the environment, for the community. And it was a good business opportunity, in addition to retaining talent in the country. So that's what pushed me. OK. What was the most challenging task in launching the startup? Uh, most challenging task in launching the uh, startup. Uh, the launch was, was uh, so basically for me, there was not like a particular, particular uh, point of launch. It was just going with the, with the flow. Uh, the, the challenge was actually in the expansion. Uh, so so that's, that's my answer. The challenge was in the expansion. And in the expansion, the challenge is finding the right partners. Yes. OK, so do you see any opportunities for entrepreneurs to launch businesses that facilitate access to green financing? Ah, I jumped one. How did you finance your startup? At the beginning, uh, it was um, my own time, basically. And when I scored a project, I was taking a certain, I, I did a good calculation of how much to take as an initial percentage and to have a good credit uh, facility uh, with the suppliers. So basically, it was putting my reputation on, uh, on, on uh, the line and making sure I deliver. So it was my time, some of my money, getting good credit limits and facilities, and really doing good calculations. But, but uh, it was a pure bootstrapping. Okay, so we have uh, Charles, a great talent, Antoine. Hopefully, you would be able to overcome all the challenges. Any potential market for Riego in KSA? Uh, actually, yes, and we're working uh, on several projects with, um, with several stakeholders. We have NDA signed, so I cannot mention more. But uh, the water situation in KSA is, uh, is really challenging. They've already depleted a lot of their aquifers and underwater uh, reserves. And they're funding and looking for a lot of opportunities to monitor, control um, uh, their agricultural uh, needs. Because uh, as you know, they are the biggest exporters uh, of dates. And dates require a lot of uh, water. And in the past, the government has supported alfalfa uh, farming in addition to uh, wheat and barley. So, so a lot of their agricultures consume a lot of water. So they have big need for such solutions. Okay, do you offer internships or any other way to spread your knowledge and help young people to improve their skills? Uh, 
definitely. We're always open for that. We always have interns on board. Please connect. Let's talk. Uh, what are the drawbacks of starting a company in Lebanon? Challenges. I think you're um, asking, do you want to add anything? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's like um, this change every month. Uh, and now I don't recommend anyone to start a company uh, uh, in Lebanon. Like you don't have the financial backbone to support nor the legal. And uh, it's extremely not stable. You can have uh, your bank account elsewhere. There are plenty of options to have a bank, bank account outside. And uh, honestly, having a Lebanese reputation nowadays is not the best. Yeah, but, but I think uh, this is what I usually say to our startups is that maybe now is the time for them to do all the research needed and uh, do they can learn a lot. Analysis. Exactly. The Lebanese ecosystem is great. It's a small country where you have a lot of diversity. I learned a lot on technical level. I'm still learning. Uh, level of competence is high. It's a great place to get talent. Um, I'm just saying on the legal, political, stability, uh, financial aspect, it's not the best. Yes. So take the time now to actually start working on it before launching it. Uh, yeah. Like this, yeah, whenever... It's a great place to have a kitchen and a base. Our base is here. It will always be here. Uh, 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 as long as we have internet. That's, 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 <laughs> yes. that's our, uh, yeah, breaking point. Okay, so you've mentioned, okay, you've mentioned uh, bootstrapping in your early days. Any advice for entrepreneurs who are bootstrapping their way into a fully mature business? Uh, yeah, I, I got an advice once and it's just insist, just keep going, but, but always uh, make, make sure to know when, when to stop. Like you can't keep going blindly. Okay, uh, we still have uh, three more questions and then we'll have to close. So what was your experience with, uh, with the Lebanese talent for the machine learning algorithm ad addition to Riego? Um, the guy who uh, I was working with on machine learning, uh, his name is Mahmoud Abbasi. He's now, uh, he went to Eindhoven and he's now uh, working uh, in machine learning in the Netherlands. And he's, he's, he was a student back then. Uh, I worked with several, several other people. Uh, currently, I'm working with someone who's, who's in Lebanon, works with BMW. Uh, we have a lot of talent. And, and uh, extremely talented people uh, and and they really know what they're doing so i had great experience do you see any opportunities for entrepreneurs to launch businesses that facilitate access to green financing um, so facilitating access to green financing today in lebanon is not the smartest i'll tell you why with all due respect because assuming you facilitated for a factory uh, to get a loan from somewhere, uh, I don't know where, uh, you did that link. And this guy was able to purchase his equipment in US dollars. And the deal that he's doing with the government is to sell that energy uh, at, uh, with, uh, uh, on Lebanese pound on the official market rate. And this is not a very attractive project. You're losing 40, 50% of, uh, of the value. So um, I, I think it needs a bit, a bit of a stability and, and more certainty in the market. But definitely, yes. Um, definitely, yes. Uh, because uh, the banks in Lebanon are, are not able to, to do that. So if possible, yes. OK. And the last question, are you willing to scale to MENA? What is your strategy? Do they have the same challenges and energy? So now we're, in, now we're in Cyprus and we're in KSA and we did a few projects in Oman. We, did, uh, we were able to get another consulting job in Pakistan. So yes, we're expanding. Uh, uh, so in energy, each country has its own specificity uh, and we usually do a thorough market analysis before we decide what's the go-to uh, market strategy. And in KSA, our go-to market is energy as a service. So uh, we were able to establish a fund and create a consortium with uh, big players in the market where we're going to invest in a solar infrastructure and sell the energy uh, as a service instead. Um, 
each market has a different uh, needs. Um, so to answer that question, we need to go like country by country and situation by situation. But yeah, we're doing that as we speak. Thank you so much, Antoine. So I would like to thank you all our guests speakers and entrepreneurs, so Ziad Abishakir, Salah Sadiba, Hassan Hirajli, Antoine Skayem, and Mark Hoon. Uh, stay tuned for the content of uh, next Tuesday webinar and ho hope to see you then. I will end this uh, with the video for the people that uh, could, didn't uh, watch it yet. And please, if you think you have an innovative solution in the clean tech sector, uh, just go on uh, Beritech website and uh, search your application. Here we go, and thank you all. So, uh, okay, apparently I did not share my, uh, my screen, so just one second. Okay, I'll stop sharing and share again. Here we go. I think now you can see it. Thank you all, and here we go. Okay.